So um, welcome everyone. It, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all today here. A very good morning and good afternoon to all of you joining us today from Germany, India, and some other parts of the world as well. I see we have uh, participants from Turkey, UK, um, uh, Slovenia, Belarus. So definitely there is a lot of interest and enthusiasm. Uh, some of you may already know. My name is Pallavi. I am the Germany country head of Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. In short, FICCI FICI. I am based in Berlin and I'll be moderating today's session. Uh, on behalf of FICI and BVMW, the German Metal Stand Association, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the first maiden, uh, maiden um, um, edition of Indo-German Metal Stand SME Business Summit today. We have an excellent lineup of speakers joining us from both countries. We will begin with opening session, followed by a presentation on how German Mittelstand can be a key driver in prosperous Indo-German relationship by BVMW. We will then be joined by experts for two very interesting panel discussions. But before the panel discussion, we will have two senior industry speakers joining us as keynote speakers. At the end, we will have a validatory session where we will be joined by Parliamentary uh, State Secretary, Mr. Bartley and Mr. Yan. So without taking any more time, uh, please join me in welcoming our first speaker of the day, Mr. Markus Jerger, Executive Director, BVMW. Mr. Jerger wears many hats. He is an entrepreneur, a historic real estate developer, counselor, and has been member of the boards of several international high-performing business organizations, think tanks, advisory councils, an influential association for many years. He, uh, since last year, he is also the chairman of the Global SME Forum. He also lectures at leadership academies, conferences, and universities. Mr. Yerger, please. Thank you very much, and welcome, everyone. Thank you, Mrs. Pallavi Mishra, for your wonderful opening, and everyone in India for joining this conference today. We are very proud that we have the opportunity to work together with FICCI for, on this first Indo-German Mittelstand Business Summit. I also want to welcome important co-speakers and people that are part of this conference, uh, including Mr. Bartle, the Parliamentarian Secretary to the Federal Minister of Economic Cooperation and Development, the BMZ. I'd like to welcome very warm-heartedly Mr. Shabra, the Secretary and of the Ministry of External Affairs of the Government of India. Clearly, Mr. Dirk Wiese, who we know very well, also at BBMW, who is a member of the German Bundestag and Chairman of the German-Indian Parliamentarian Friendship Group. I welcome Dr. Mohart, the Council General uh, of the Federal Republic of Germany in Mumbai, Deep Chinoy, Dilip Chinoy, the Secretary General of FICCI, uh, who joins us and who is my counterpart in India. Welcome. And Mr. Manish Singhal, the Deputy Secretary General uh, of the FICCI. Welcome to all of you speakers and participants. Uh, a few words about BBMW. Some 40 years ago, this association was created by German businessmen, family owners of businesses to exchange information, best practice and data, how to access world markets. And it has grown in the meantime to one of the largest association representing business interest in Germany. We have now in our SME Alliance at BBMW 32 industry associations with over 900,000 members. I know 900,000 is for you a small city, but for us, it's quite an important number. I'm also very happy that Dr. Grün joins us at this conference today. So our members come from all sectors of business, as small as two employees, as big as 70,000 employees. And we do have from trading to recycling business, automotive suppliers, packaging uh, companies, every single sector that we represent in our association. With 340 offices in Germany, we hold over 2,000 conferences 
annually to inform our members about business opportunities. We connect around about 800,000 uh, medium-sized company owners per year. And recently, thanks to Mr. Jan, uh, who has helped to organize this con uh, conference, our director of foreign affairs, we have opened some 65 international offices covering 105 countries, including India. Now, we all have experienced a very dramatic one and a half years of economic decline, of struggle, of COVID challenges, and it was very complicated also for our members to go through this uh, very complicated period of time. Now, to give you a few numbers about the German Mittelstand, the German Mittelstand out of 3.5 million companies in Germany total, 3.49 million, so just short 10,000 companies, this is the German Mittelstand. Some 10,000 companies are state-owned companies, public quoted companies, and companies that are exceeding 1,000 employees. The rest, 3.49 million, is the German Mittelstand. It is by far the most important educator, if you like, of uh, new work staff. It is the largest employer with nearly 30 million people in the marketplace. And the German Mittelstand, the backbone of the economy, is a significant player in the invention and recording of patents in Germany. 80% of all German apprentices are trained in the German Mittelstand. We are very proud, therefore, that we have also a link to India. And we are represented by two foreign representatives from India in our association. And I thank Mr. Bave and Mr. Raja that they do such an excellent work for us, connecting Indian and German business relationships. We have created other partnerships in India, among them an MOU with the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, which is your organization, FICCI, and with the Engineering Exports Promotion Council, the EEPC. This will help us that we strengthen our, uh, strengthen our relationship between the countries, and we already organize regularly events and delegation trips across the border to bring German and Indian SME, the Mittelstand, together. I'd like to really express my profound gratitude to FICCI for their contribution to the German-Indian Mittelstand relationship. Through the years of our cooperation, FICCI has proven itself as a very reliable and valuable partner. Together, by joining our efforts, we are facilitating German-Indian economic cooperation and opening of new doors for new opportunities to do business for our SMEs. Most recently, and a small example, in cooperation with the Indian Consulate and FICCA BBMW, our organization organized the delivery of 1,500 oxygen concentrators from a German company, OxyCare, to Indian hospitals. This was honored in both the German and the Indian press as a very good example how across the border relationships can help people to, to heal or prosper. Our relationships are based on a profound history and a good background and trust and a clear, fair and continuous political dialogue. And I thank Mr. Wiese on this occasion for all the contributions he makes for this excellent uh, dialogue and cooperation and friendship between our companies, uh, our countries. The official platform for direct dialogue is a well-known Indo-German intergovernmental consultation platform, and that takes place every two years since 2011 in rotation in both countries. We also know that it's important to keep these links between the years alive because we have a strong cultural 
relationship between the two countries. Germany is the second most important research partner for India after the US. There are many state sponsored cultural projects which are facilitating the cultural exchange. Numerous Goethe institutes and centers in India give a chance to learn German language and culture for native population. And German language is also part of the curriculum in dozens of schools in India. I can tell you, Mr. Wiese, we have to work harder because I know that very few Germans can speak Hindu. So we have a big job to do. It is not fair that so many Indian people take, make the effort to learn German and we don't speak their language. So a lot to do. Well, important is also that around 25,000 Indian students are currently enrolled in German universities, which is the second highest number of all international students. We are a strong trading partner and investment partner for India for decades. And some German companies have been in, 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 present in India for more than a century. Germany is India's most important trading partner within the EU and seventh most important trading partner globally. The economic relations between India and Germany have developed dynamically in recent years. Approximately 1,800 German companies have started new business and investment opportunities in India. The interest of Indian companies in Germany gladly is also growing steadily. Both countries complement each other, which creates a great opportunity for further cooperation based on common principles that we all share, democracy, freedom, the rule of law, and the respect for human rights. India is the second largest country in the world by population, the world's largest democracy, and the largest English-speaking nation in the world. For us, an immense opportunity to increase business because Germans generally speak English, like democracy, like freedom, and they like your culture. India is one of the biggest markets, therefore, for business worldwide, but also for German businesses. India is, in addition, the fastest growing economy in the world. And India has developed to a global player, especially in high tech and IT, also businesses. Germany has a vast interest in participating. India is a very attractive market for global startups across sectors like fintech, consumer technology, e-commerce, and tech in general. And India offers a huge pool of young, skilled, English-speaking manpower. And you know that Germany lacks Fachkräfte, of skilled workers here in Germany. So please do visit us, we need you. The accessibility of the Indian market makes it very attractive for foreign startups, and the Indian government is welcoming investments in the country with very easy access. Now, some facts about Germany that you might want to know. Germany is Europe's economic engine and the world's fourth largest economy. I would add thanks to the strong, innovative, and in some ways also risk-taking attitude of the German Mittelstand. Germany has one of the highest productivity rates in the world. It has an excellent workforce. It's a number one location for research and has great innovative power. Germany is also a leading global force in high-tech solutions and has a first-class infrastructure. And you might be happy to hear that Berlin, after 20 years of constructing an airport, finally also has a functioning airport. We also offer safe and secure investment frameworks. And I think we can agree that made in Germany is still a very good reputation to have in the world. And one of the reasons why German companies, especially the SMEs, are truly innovative uh, is because we offer a quite special training system, the dual training system, which is firmly established in the German education system. We also cooperate in the dual system strongly between the education sector 
and the small and medium sized companies. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the dual education is such a success. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that we can offer you today in this conference important impulses, information and incentives that you create an interest and you have hunger and a desire to invest and cooperate between India and Germany stronger. I wish everyone participating not only a lot of success, but most importantly, I wish you always good health and that you prosper through life in business as much as with your own family and health. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address you today. And uh, I like to give back to the desk of the FICCI. Thank you, Mr. Yerger. That was such an encouraging uh, um, opening lines. Thank you once again. Uh, without taking any more time, I would invite our next speaker, mixed, uh, Mr. Dirk Wieser. Um, I know Mr. Wieser has to leave uh, at 10.30. So, Mr. Wieser, I will keep your introduction very short and crisp. You are the member of German Bundestag and chairman of German Indian Parliamentary Friendship Group. Uh, rest of your details are very well known to all of us. So, Mr. Wieser, the screen is yours. Thank you um, very much, um, dear Mr. Jürger, dear uh, Rahul Shabra, um, Dilip Chinoy, Manish Singhal. First of all, let me say it's an honor for me to participate at this um, really important summit the, that we face here today. And um, let me um, say at the beginning that if we look back on the 7th March of 1951, um, in, in 1951, we see that this year we celebrate 70 years of diplomatic relations between our two countries, between our two democratic countries, to, to say this. And uh, 20 years later, in the year 1971, in, uh, we founded in German Parliament the German Indian Parliamentary Friendship Group. So, also this year, we have two big celebrations that shows how important our relations are how long our relations are and how long we work very closely together to strengthen our bilateral relations. And I'm, to say this very open, I'm a strong believer in German-Indian relationship and I see a big potential also in the next years and I see also a big potential in our economic relation. And I'm very thankful to Mr. Jürger that he um, put this on the agenda today uh, and we see where we can have also in the next years a closer cooperation, of course. But um, let me say at the beginning um, that also in the last weeks we in Germany see the dramatic situation uh, in India of the corona pandemic. And I think it is very good that our both countries work very close together, that the uh, German uh, military brings oxygen generation plants to India. Uh, in the last weeks also seven oxygen generation plants to J and K. And that shows we want to help our Indian friends in this dramatic situation and we can do what we, um, we, we do what we can do in this situation to uh, be at your side. And it's good also that virologists from our both country closely working together on genome sequencing um, to better also understand these new virus variants. And that shows how close our corporations are also in the healthcare sector and that shows also um, that this um, um, we are on a good way uh, to, to face this challenge of this corona pandemic and that we see a better situation, I hope, in the next weeks and months, of course, globally. Um, I said the German-Indian economic relation, I think we, we, we can do more to be open today. Um, of course, I think it's a very positive signal that in the last weeks, uh, the European Union and um, the Indian government started um, new talks for um, a free trade agreement between our uh, between the European Union and um, India. You know, for more than eight years, no negotiations um, were, were possible, different reasons, of course, I know, but there is such a great potential uh, that we see also from Germany in this free trade agreement, especially in the closer cooperation also to face the challenges of um, um, of our climate. Um, we can have a closer cooperation also in renewable energy, for example. We have big potential in investments in the infrastructure, of course. I think here also German Mittelstand is a very potential partner. There's a lot of things to offer 
to do more, of course, in this sector. And as we see um, that also for the German economy, uh, we see um, the big potential because uh, the Bertelsmann Foundation, they said we can see more than four or five billion uh, uh, euros that we can put our um, bilateral trade agenda up in this situation. So there, there's so much potential and I'm uh, very, um, and I see that the, the BVMW uh, put this on the agenda today is, of course, in my point of view, of course, very positive. My home constituency in Germany is one of the biggest industrial areas in Germany. We have a lot of SMEs, the backbone of German industry. We are the third biggest industrial region in Germany. And if I look back on the um, big event of the Hannover Fair in 2014, where Indian was partner country, we saw what a great uh, potential in the, our economic relationship we can um, have in the future. And I uh, was one of a big supporter also of the program Make in India Mittelstand, where we want to bring German SMEs to India to produce their products in India. And I think we can do here a lot of things also uh, in the upcoming months to strengthen also these ideas that we face on the uh, Hannover Fair in 2014, of course. And I also see and Mr. Jerga said it, that there's also a great potential in the IT sector. Uh, during my time as the Deputy Minister for, Eco, um, for, Eco, for Economy and Energy, uh, in 2017, I had the honor to launch the GINSEP program, the German-Indian Exchange um, program to bring German and Indian startups together. And also here is a great potential uh, for the upcoming months and um, the years in our economic relationship, of course. But also to say this, if we want to bring SMEs from Germany together with, um, uh, with our partner country, India, we also see a big potential in the partnership between the German so-called Bundesländer and the Indian states. We have these partnerships, of course, uh, I see Mr. Mohart with um, Maharashtra and uh, Baden-Württemberg, of course, we have um, Bavaria with Karnataka and we have um, North Rhine-Westphalia, my home area, uh, with West Bengal. And also here is a big potential uh, where we can do a lot of more things in the future to strengthen our economic relationships. To end, I'm very thankful that we have this possibility of this summit today. It shows the potential, it shows a big interest if I see the audience who is, which is participating today. So um, again, I'm a strong believer in German-Indian relationships, uh, also in the upcoming seven years or the upcoming 50 years of the German-Indian Parliamentary Friendship Group. Um, so again, uh, thank you very much for organizing this. Thanks to Fiki, thanks to the BMW um, for uh, make this possible today. And um, I feel sorry that I have to leave at um, 10.30 German time, but we have a last minute appointment to negotiating a lawmaking process here in German parliament, because you know, we have a big elections in September and we have the last two weeks of parliamentary sessions, actually. So it's always a little, little bit busy at the moment. So um, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. We have the possibility to participate. Bahat dan Jabat. Thank you so much, Mr. Visa. It's it's always such a pleasure to listen to your words and the way you you feel about Indo-German relationship. That really encourages encourages us to do more. Thank you once again. Now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Dilip Chinoy, who is the Secretary General of FICCI, Fiki. Uh, a very quick introduction of Mr. Chinoy, because we, uh, I know we have very eminent speakers uh, waiting to, to share their, their thoughts with us. So, yes, very quickly, uh, before joining uh, Fiki, Mr. Chinoy served as Managing Director and CEO of NSDC, Na National Skill Development Corporation. Um, prior to NSTC, Mr. Chinoy was directly gen Director General of CM, Society of Indian Automobile Manufacturers, and he also served as Deputy Director General of Confederation of Indian Industry. He also serves uh, on the Executive Committee of Bureau of Indian Standards. Mr. Chinoy was awarded the Indian Achievers Award in 2018, the Game Changer Award in 2015, and the Rashtriya Media Ratan Award in 2013. So, uh, thank you, Pallavi. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Pallavi. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Vizay, Member of Parliament, Germany, and Chairman of the German Indian Parliamentary Friendship Group, Mr. Rahul Chabra, Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, Dr. Jurgen Morhard, uh, Council General of the Federal Republic of Germany in Mumbai, uh, Mr. Marcus Yeager, Executive Director, BVMW, Mr. Andreas Yan, Head International Markets, BVMW. 
my colleagues Manish Shingal, Rohit Sharma, and Pallavi Mishra. Good morning to all in Germany and a good afternoon to colleagues in India. First of all, on behalf of FICCI, uh, it's my pleasure to actually thank uh, both uh, BVMW, uh, the, the people of Germany, uh, for the tremendous help and support that you have extended during the last mm -hmm. pandemic uh, to the people of India, including what Mr. Weiser said, the oxygen plants to Jammu and Kashmir. It is really a very thoughtful gesture, and we are indebted uh, to all of you for enabling this to happen. As you said earlier, what else could be um, a better time to organize the first Indo-German Middleton Business Summit, uh, celebrating 70 years of diplomatic relations with Germany? Delighted uh, to be here uh, with this summit with our MOU partners in Germany, BVMW, and thank you for your cooperation and partnership. Since we are talking about years, uh, you know, I would just like to share with you uh, this year, 2021, marks the 85th year of our actual engagement with Germany. In 1936, uh, FICI set up its first overseas office in Germany. And since uh, both uh, uh, Mr. Yeager and Mr. Weiser talked about skills, uh, the first representation that FICI officially made uh, to the German government was all the Indians who were working in Germany to be enrolled as apprentices in the apprentice system in Germany. So that's just a historical uh, fact uh, just to share with you. And we've been constantly engaged with Germany uh, since then. Uh, we do have uh, a lot of the associated chambers who are members of us, but you know, uh, our numbers of membership are slightly smaller than yours. Uh, we have around 250,000 uh, firms who are indirectly members to us, and we're not present in as many countries and, and locations as you are, but we are in 16 uh, centers in India and, of course, uh, eight uh, overseas. Um, I want to say that a lot of what I wanted to say about Indo-German trade has been covered by the speakers earlier, but before I go into a brief uh, two or three points on that, I'd like to thank and acknowledge your partner, LNP Technologies uh, for your support of this uh, event. Like it was said earlier, German companies boast of a track record of being long-standing and dependable investors in India. Um, more, more than 100, some companies have been present in India for more than 100 years. I think investments in Germany, uh, Indian investments in Germany also are, are significant, as has been said. Uh, within the European Union, Germany currently receives the highest percentage of India's total FDI outflow. Because of the huge economic and social significance of the Middle Eastern, uh, there is a further potential to increase both the presence in India and partnerships to look at labor and capital productivity. I think because of this size, they're perfect testing grounds for greater, greener innovation and smart investments, as you have said. And therefore, the application of new age technologies and small and medium enterprises will help them becoming more competitive and resilient. And like you mentioned, that India is a, is, uh, is a number one center for German research. I believe that it is an opportunity to work together. In a new area, which is startups, which are also small companies, there's a huge opportunity to work together. And uh, I believe that um, this is something which we will be exploring uh, between our relationships uh, as we go forward. I don't want to take up more of your time, but I want to thank each of the speakers uh, who has uh, agreed to share their experience with us. I would like to extend a very special welcome to Mr. Rahul uh, Chabra and uh, to, the, uh, to the others who are speaking. Thank you very much uh, for joining. And once again, a very good morning uh, to all in Germany and good afternoon in India. Stay well and keep safe. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much for your comments, uh, for your remarks. I would now like to invite our next uh, guest speaker, Mr. Rahul Chabra, Secretary, Economic Relations, Ministry of External Affairs, MEA, Government of India. Mr. Chabra joined as Secretary, Economic Relations, MEA, exactly a year ago from now. Prior to taking over his current role, um, he was the High Commissioner to Kenya, Ambassador uh, to Somalia, and Permanent Representative to the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP. 
and the United Nations Human Settlements Program, UN Habitat, based in Nairobi from November 2018 to June 2020. He was uh, ambassador to Hungary and, and Bosnia and Herzegovina from August 2015 to October 2018. At headquarters, he worked as a Joint Secretary, Central Europe. He conceived and organized the first two editions of the India Central Europe Business Forum, which has now become a regular feature in the Indian business calendar. While earlier serving in New Delhi, he has been part of India's delegation to the World Economic Forum's uh, uh, Forum at Davos to promote foreign investment into India. Later, he served as Director for External Publicity at the Ministry of External Affairs and Director in the Foreign Sub Secretary's Office. During his stints abroad, Mr. Chabra has served in Kenya, Hungary, China, United States, Philippines, France, Senegal, and Belgium. So, uh, over to you for your remarks. Namaste. Thank you so much, uh, Pallavi, for those. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, I just thought I'll uh, break up my uh, remarks into six sort of sections. There's some introductory remarks followed by the current status of the economic relationship. Uh, go on to some of the big ideas uh, which people have talked about. Uh, then come to the meat of the matter, the middle stand, and how we can collaborate. Uh, going on to finally reaching the sort of uh, how the building blocks are in position, and then some concluding remarks. Uh, don't worry, it won't take too long because uh, since uh, being in the second half of uh, already so many eminent speakers have spoken before me, uh, so I noticed that a lot of the ground has been covered. So now my job will be to make it into more of a pressy format and keep it uh, tight without repeating things that have already been said so that you anyway don't switch off since it's uh, early afternoon and you've all probably had a nice hearty lunch, uh, which we are missing from Fiki uh, today. They have strategically positioned this uh, just after lunch. No. Uh, so, uh, Dilip uh, mentioned about some anniversaries and all that. So, I'll start about with also with an anniversary. Uh, it's also uh, over two decades since the strategic partnership, uh, 2000, in the year 2000, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, we look at it more from a strategic point of view at the Ministry of External Affairs. So, this uh, partnership with Germany is of that nature and it's already been two decades of that uh, partnership which really gives us the weight uh, behind it so it's not just only purely business and economics and uh, that is also due to india's bipartisan approach outreach uh, to this relationship and probably a fair bit due to chancellor merkel's uh, continuity in her position so we've been uh, blessed and uh, Happy to have had this sort of uh, continuity, which we hope will continue after the September elections that were referred to also. Coming to the current status of the economic relationship, uh, I think uh, the figures were mentioned by Marcus and uh, Dilip also. Uh, so just very quickly, some part which may not have been referred to uh, is out of the 1800 companies in present in India, uh, 600 are joint ventures. So that's a pretty uh, good sum. Uh, and uh, the ones that uh, Dilip mentioned about companies being here over a century, just to jog the memory, not that people need to remember Siemens, Bosch, Bayer, Daimler. I mean, these are all household names in India. Uh, so they've been around for so long. Uh, also that uh, the frequent visits of the heads of state by the intergovernmental commission uh, that was referred to also has helped this relationship, uh, including in the economic field, uh, move ahead. So I come to the third part of uh, my presentation where uh, I was reading about some of the big ideas uh, that could move this thing forward. Uh, one is the HSR, the high speed railway, which I'm told proposals are there, uh, Chennai, Bengaluru, Mysore. And uh, if that goes through, there are, I think I'm told six more in the pipeline. Uh, there is a strategic financing initiative for Asia, uh, which is there on the table. Uh, there's a high technology partnership group uh, this is the, India could be a defense industry partner to Germany. Uh, so these are all the sort of uh, big ticket items, big ideas that could uh, move this forward. Uh, but uh, in that context, also, we were talking about uh, companies and corporate uh, entities uh, in Germany and how the middle sun, uh, just 10,000 companies that are out of it, all the rest, uh, a few million uh, fall within that. Uh, but what I found was in the DAX, uh, out of the 30 companies in the DAX, uh, 26 are present in India, but the minute you come to the MDAX, out of the 60, only 28 are present there. 
So you can already see it dropping off. And if you come to the middle stand, then uh, I don't want to get into the percentages. It won't be a uh, very uh, picture, which I think we can work upon. So let's put it that way. Uh, it gives a lot of scope for uh, all of us to sort of, uh, and this seminar, to come up with ideas and you know move this forward. So coming to the middle stand again, I think uh, Marcus uh, mentioned about uh, the role of the middle stand, so we, I won't have to uh, go over that. Uh, but uh, where I'll come in is, uh, we're looking at at least four areas I could think of clearly. Some of them again were referred to, but I'll just highlight the four that I thought, where uh, both countries should collaborate in the middle stand sector. Uh, so there, if I may be permitted, we can start with uh, artificial intelligence and digitalization, the first of such areas, uh, wherein also there is already a digital experts group, which is working on uh, direct application of many of these technologies, like the industry 4.0, uh, regulatory framework, e-governance, uh, education, training, social services. So uh, this is a sector with a lot of promise, uh, AI and digitalization. Uh, the second area where uh, we could collaborate with the Middle Sand is uh, environment and sustainability. Uh, again, here the EU Green Deal uh, to make it uh, carbon neutral by 2050 and uh, Germany's itself recent climate protection regulations to become carbon neutral by 2045. Uh, really fit in very well with our commitment and our target under the Paris Agreement for adopting 40% of uh, non-fossil-based power capacity by 2030. So there's a real uh, convergence of interests uh, in that sector. And both co countries are moving in the sort of right direction and the same direction uh, for sustainable development. Uh, the third area where we could collaborate with the Middle Sand is uh, we have seen that uh, this is supply chain resilience. Uh, we have seen the dangers over the last few months of uh, over-reliance on a particular geography uh, for the supply chains. So uh, in that sense, uh, both uh, India, Indian SMEs, uh, MSMEs, and the Middle Sand uh, could work together. Uh, there are lots of the PLI schemes that have been launched, the production link incentive schemes. So several German companies uh, are using that, and we'd encourage others to come forward in the supply chain uh, initiative. And the last sector, again, here, uh, even Mr. Dirk, Wiesel, I think he's left yeah, here at a meeting, uh, Mr. Dirk Wiesel referred to it uh, as where the virologists are also working together. Uh, so I'd put it more broadly, uh, the healthcare sector, uh, where again, uh, where the PLI scheme has been launched and uh, even in the manufacturing of covers APIs. Uh, so out of 200 pharmaceutical companies, uh, only four have just received approvals, but uh, I think uh, over 200 have applied. So there's a lot of scope uh, here in the healthcare sector. Uh, and of course, you're aware of India's uh, uh, capacity for vaccine manufacturing, ARV drugs, uh, but of course, we are aware of German capacities also. So I think a lot of scope for collaboration in R&D, clinical testing, uh, mass production of a low cost vaccine. Uh, so we could look at this healthcare sector. Uh, coming quickly to the penultimate portion, the building blocks that are already in position. So that's a good thing. Uh, uh, the policy that the government has recently done in terms of startup India, digital India, all these are sort of uh, already existing. So that's the first uh, building block that already in position. Uh, the second one is for German companies already there's a fast track system of approvals at our Department of Industrial uh, Policy and Promotion. Uh, so I would encourage uh, Germany, German companies do have that sort of uh, green track or however you want to call it. Uh, to get a quick approval. Uh, also, again, this was referred to, which the embassy is doing uh, in Berlin, uh, the Make in India Middle Sun, uh, wherein over 135 companies seem to have benefited over a billion dollars of in, uh, investments sort of coming in since 2015. Uh, so these are the sort of uh, uh, large building blocks. And the last one that I wanted to mention uh, was the uh, SNT sector, the SNT center. There's an Indo-German SNT center also, uh, which is already existing. Uh, so we can easily sort of, you know, uh, leapfrog uh, using these building blocks that exist. Uh, so as a conclusion, uh, again, the first part of the conclusion was referred to by uh, M Member of Parliament Vise, uh, where he referred to the regional dimension, uh, so which is very critical, and he mentioned the three big linkages that already exist. So we need to build on those and get more linkages going. Uh, my second uh, broad concluding remark is, uh, again, with the EU, again, the mention, 
that the trade investment agreement uh, is restarted the negotiations after a gap. Uh, so we are confident that this will sort of uh, come out to a closure soon. And I'm sure uh, we'll have more German companies benefiting from that. Uh, the last uh, comment that I wanted to make as a conclusion is that uh, I think still uh, it's a little bit of mindset change that the middle stand needs to do. And I hope uh, events like today's uh, will help some people move in that sort of uh, direction uh, is wherein uh, we, sorry, my computer seems to be playing up. I hope you guys are still with me because this technology. Yes, sir. Oh, good. It keeps saying it's, yeah, uh, it's, fine. it's updating some sort of background software. I don't know. So before it starts doing all this AI and all on its own, uh, I'll quickly end. Maybe it's a signal for me to end. Uh, Fiki has been sending these signals. Uh, no, uh, it's, uh, I think they're looking more at it, uh, India as a challenge uh, rather than an opportunity. Uh, so it is a challenge, or maybe it's a challenging opportunity. I mean, you know, uh, but it's it's really the opportunity that uh, Mitsusan needs to sense, grab, uh, and take over. You know, uh, the quick mover sort of uh, advantage. So uh, we hope that uh, today uh, this will be one of those such events that uh, we're in, we are inviting German companies to come in, uh, and particularly with Mitsusan companies. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Good Thank you, sir. Uh, very pertinent remarks. Well, as they say, no pain, no gain. So I'm sure German middle stand companies would be up for it. Uh, thank you. So this brings me to our next speaker, which is a very uh, pleasant addition to our program. Now, please welcome uh, Dr. Jurgen Mornhard. Uh, Dr. Mornhard has been uh, serving as the Consul General of the Federal Republic of Germany in Mumbai since July 2016. His love for India and the potential of uh, furthering Indo-German ties convinced Dr. Monhart to stay back in India and probably convinced him to come back uh, and, and be with us in this program. Uh, Dr. Monhart, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having me on short notice. I'm very happy to join so many eminent uh, and renowned co-panelists here. And I think everybody, everybody's added so many uh, things already. So they're and in a very comprehensive way, they are not much to say. I'd like to just talk about three surprises I have seen to me in my last six years here in, in uh, Mumbai. First of all, there was a change of mindset, a change of mindset in Europe, a change of mindset in Germany. When I started my career more than 30 years ago, we were talking for 32 years when we're talking about Asia, about Asia Pacific all of a sudden a term changed, right? And the term changed to Indo-Pacific. Asia-Pacific is that, Indo-Pacific is a new mindset. And this has a lot to do, uh, maybe it has been coming too late, but it shows also the, the eminent role which has India has gained in, in, in our political thinking, finally, in a strategic thinking, finally, because industries have been here for centuries. Civil society's context have been here for centuries. And this is very encouraging because we have seen now policy papers, policy guidelines, not only from the German government, but also from the European Union. And also this is very encouraging because uh, besides economics, the European Union and Germany with its partners is committed to play an even stronger role also on a political level in, in Asia. The, Second thing which surprised me is also during the last years and, and really has been reinforced during the pandemic, Mittelstand companies are also here the backbone already of German investment in, in India. When you talk to Mittelstand, all of a sudden, India is not anymore only one of the many outlets around the world. No, more and more of the smaller Mittelstand companies from Germany are determined to make India their global hub the global hub for manufacturing, the global hub for research development. That I found also a very interesting twist in, in corporate policies from German Mittelstand companies, in particular over the last two years. Then all of those who are, have been hearing now about the 70 years diplomatic relationship, the parliamentary friendship groups, and, and so forth. Of course, there are many formal ways of cooperation are in place, very formal resilient structures like we have the strategic dialogue, but there's something which is also a surprise to everybody coming here and which is then even very, very helpful also for German investors and businesses is a very strong underlying fabric of 
excellent bonds between civil societies. That is something which is invisible and you only discover when you come to India and you try to do India and, and to try to be closer to India to see how many bonds are existing between civil societies in Germany and in, uh, and in India, of course. Because our, our academic and research and, and cultural relations date very much back and, and today we see so many uh, interactions as was mentioned by Dr. Wieser, right, that, that it's, it's not only that the formal things between states, it's already existing city partnerships, partnerships between uh, trade association, partnerships between schools, between Rotary clubs. It's a very, very strong network. And that it's no surprise that the help from Germany to India now at the recent uh, pandemic it came so fast and, and so overwhelmingly. And I think when we, when we calculated rights, it's, it's almost 60 million euros which have been mobilized over overnight. We have been here, of course, for us also, uh, other institutions participating here are well known and well known to us. And I know small and medium sized companies, there's also reluctancy to go abroad. I can always tell you, even if having served in places like Japan and, and, and US, no foreign market is easy, right? No foreign market is easy. And Mr. Chabra also pointed out, there are always challenges. But I can assure you that also my experience here has been showing me and many of the companies who dare to come here that the challenges are outweighed by all the opportunities and that is something to to what to leave with you because so much has been already said and uh, but i also like to assure you that we have uh, FICCI we have many institutions here like uh, invest in india we have an inter-german chamber of commerce we have uh, Fraunhofer Institute has representations here. We have uh, the Machinery Association of Germany here. There are many institutions and networks which are helpful to integrate all the newcomers and provide an, an open discussion uh, and, and round table to help uh, when you're interested in coming here. There is also from the Indian perspective, Indian industries perspective is, is an interesting change of view during the last years of Europe and European countries, because Europe is at the moment and, and has developed over the years as the only and the largest single market, which was never threatening to close, to close the trade relations, to, to uh, discriminate foreign trade, and always uh, still is, is uh, working together and looking for partners for a rule-based open uh, world and, and structures. So that I'm, I have to tell you this today. First of all, I was another surprise for me. It was the first Mittelstand Summit. Oh my God, we should have started much, much earlier. And I hope that this will now the beginning and the kickoff of, of a re regular series where Mittelstand companies come together, not to learn the first time, but might also serve as a platform of established Mittelstand companies being in India already to share their experiences with, with the others. And, and thus, I wish today's uh, first summit a success. And I hope that I see you all on the second, third, and, and even more summits to come. And I have to tell you, I have to rush back because today is the Wirtschaftstag, the business day of the German Annual Ambassadors Conference, where, of course, also India and the Indo Pacific are playing a major role. All the best to all of you, and stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you, Dr. Morhart. Those were really encouraging words and, and uh, a very special thank you on behalf of all the organizers for joining us today. I know like you, you've, you've said you're extremely busy, yet you're coming here and spending few minutes with us is uh, truly, uh, truly a reward. So this uh, brings me to our uh, last speaker of the opening session. Uh, please join me in welcoming Mr. Manish Singhal, Deputy Secretary General of FICCI FICI. He has been with us uh, since 2012 in FICI. Mr. Singhal oversees the global outreach of FICI to further the business interests of Indian industry and strategic approach of the government of India. Uh, Mr. Singhal has spent over 22 years with some of the best in class Indian transnational companies like Tata Motors, Aisha, uh, Tata Autocom Systems, Moserbeer, etc. Um, uh, his career involves immense exposure to global multicultural business environment covering over 60 countries besides India. 
uh, your comments, please. Levy, uh, uh, Mr. Yerger, Mr. Raul Chabra, uh, Mr. Weiss, he's, he's uh, left us a while back. Uh, likewise, Dr. Jurgen Warhart uh, and Mr. Yan, uh, Secretary General, Levy, my colleagues Rohit and Anita. Uh, today, along with almost 100 other participants uh, from India and Germany, uh, good morning and good afternoon to all of you. I think last 45 to 50 minutes have been quite enriching and inspiring personally for me uh, when we would talk of Indo-German engagement. Uh, it's not been so in the recent times. So what I'll probably just do uh, rather than repeating any of what all has been said, frankly, uh, with these eminent speakers, I have nothing more to say, but just uh, putting a few thoughts together in terms of uh, takeaways from this session. Uh, yes, German middle stand is the backbone of German economy, as Mr. Jerger said. So is the Indian mid-size and small companies who are equally um, uh, important for our economy. Though, of course, in terms of size and revenues, uh, there may not be full parity, but importance remains the same. So when it comes to German uh, SMEs, we also understand that, uh, uh, you know, the family-owned businesses and uh, the middle stand was generally able to tide over the difficult times, especially during the pandemic last year. Though, of course, it was not the case with the Indian uh, small and mid-sized companies. Hence, uh, like the Indian company, the German middle stand was also under increasing pressure, uh, uh, you know, for expanding the business. And that's where probably the opportunity comes today. The pressure for the German middle stand, uh, we understand also comes uh, in terms of digitization and a digital transformation of their organizations along with having the ability to get more qualified professionals, uh, especially in areas of construction, technology, engineering, and healthcare. We were already told that in R&D, uh, Germany is already India's second largest partner after the US. So keeping all this in mind, I think this is somewhere uh, India and Germany complement each other very well. Uh, you know, uh, international uh, going to EU from India, but now increasingly to Germany. And yes, they do learn German. Of course, uh, they all manage very well with English also. And at the same time, there is also a lot of students who are increasing. I think Jürgen mentioned it in his opening remarks. So this is this is actually augering well for the future because these students probably would be the future, uh, you know, uh, uh, workers and uh, specialists for Germany. And this trend should continue. In terms of, um, uh, uh, you know, middle stand companies and their cooperation with India, I think middle stand companies have a lot to offer in terms of high technology products and high quality products. At the same time, India complements by offering an ecosystem for mass manufacturing at very, very competitive uh, costs and at the same time, very, very high quality. I think this is where the Make in India Middle Stand program, which we started and Mr. Uh, Wiese mentioned about, uh, is, is the way forward for both uh, India and Germany. Uh, Fiki uh, also recognizes that, you know, there is always a need for the German Middle Stand to look at suitable partners because, yes, India is difficult. And like uh, Pallavi said, no gain without pain. Um, but to get that gain and to get into the right partners with India, this is where in, uh, FIKI offers very, very specialized uh, services uh, uh, to find the right match for the middle stand companies. So with, with these, uh, I would say, basic linkages and building blocks, which uh, Secretary Chabra mentioned about the building blocks which are in place, I think we only have to just give another big push uh, and, and the mindsets which are moving very positive in Germany and at the same time, you know, India is being looked at in the larger realm of the Indo-Pacific. I think there, there's a lot of opportunity we, we need to take forward uh, from this uh, middle stand uh, conference. Uh, before I end, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Indrajit Sen and uh, Mr. Norman Dental, uh, the panelists and the session moderators, uh, Ms. Sharma, Mr. Manoj Barve, you know, for, for helping us to put all this together. And of course, uh, this is this has all been possible uh, due to excellent support from BVMW and LNT Technologies and the German uh, Trade and Investment uh, for their support. 
Thank you, Mr. Yerger, uh, Mr. Yan, and Mr. Daniel and Ali for your continued collaboration. I think without your support and guidance, we wouldn't have been uh, here today. Uh, before uh, uh, you know, we we wrap up. I'll just use this opportunity for giving you a one minute view of uh, one of uh, Fiki's global flagship program called Leads. It's in September, and I would request you all to join us. Thank you, sir. I will quickly, uh, you know, play a few seconds video for all of you. Uh, all of you, just bear with me. I will open this. Can you all see my screen? Great. Thank you, Pallavi. Uh, so I invite you all to join us at Leeds, and of course, my colleague in Germany, Pallavi, will share more uh, details. Uh, finally, uh, a big thank you to all of you in Germany for showing us solidarity with India during the pandemic months, uh, last five, six weeks. And thank you all again for joining us today. Let's look forward to some good knowledge sessions which follow. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much for, for highlighting uh, some of the key potential areas where we can build further. Uh, with this, we come to the end of the opening session. Now, I would like to invite Mr. Daniel Raja, who will uh, share a few thoughts. Uh, I know the time is, is short, so uh, probably Daniel Raja will have to hurry up uh, you know, and, and, and share most of his wisdom in a uh, few words. So, Daniel, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, so before I start, I also want to thank the honorable Mr. Chabra, Mr. Wiese, Dr. Mohart for their participation and uh, their remarks uh, at the first Indo-German Mittelstand Business Summit. Um, I also want to thank the leadership team and uh, the organizing team of FIKI uh, and BVMW for making this event uh, even possible. Mr. Jäger, Mr. Chenoy, Mr. Singal, and of course, a big thank you also to all the participants uh, for their engagement, even prior to the event, which uh, uh, at the end uh, generated such great excitement. And uh, I'm quite sure we will continue uh, working on such initiatives and uh, hopefully uh, we can also meet uh, next time in person. Yeah, so today, uh, just to be brief, I think uh, most of the things were already uh, discussed. I want to talk about the importance of uh, Indo-German collaborations and uh, how uh, the establishment of uh, such collaborations or uh, strategic partnerships can create a win-win situation which will benefit the economies in Germany and in India in various ways. So currently we have uh, more than uh, 1,600 uh, Indo-German collaborations and uh, as Mr. Chabra also uh, mentioned, we have uh, more than 600 joint ventures between Indian and German companies. Compared to Chinese-German collaborations, um, it is uh, needless to say uh, that this number is uh, still far too low. 
and this is mainly due due to the uh, due to Mittelstand companies, which are still very hesitant with their engagement in the Indian market. And uh, one of the main reasons be behind this is that Mittelstand companies are very conservative in their approach of, of investing in foreign markets. In fact, they are very similar to many of the family owned businesses in India. And while many of the multinationals uh, invest large amounts of money in market research, feasibility studies and uh, on consultants in order to successfully enter a new market, the Mittelstand prefers a more pragmatic way. And uh, they build strategic partnerships uh, in the respective markets with uh, business relations, which are built on mutual trust and uh, uh, loyalty only then and uh, when they feel the confidence uh, with the new market they will gradually start investing more and more uh, resources so this mindset is also the reason why many professional uh, indian companies find it so difficult uh, to win over middlestand companies as uh, their customers uh, other than in the us or in the uk business decisions are not uh, solely made uh, based on pricing, but also on the intercultural aspects. Yeah. So if we, if, we look at the, uh, if we look at some of the biggest challenges uh, which Mittelstand companies are facing in Germany, I'm quite sure that uh, Indian companies will see also the business opportunities. And one of the biggest challenges uh, here in Germany currently is the lack of IT engineers, uh, IT specialists. Uh, we have uh, especially, comp or let's say, member companies in rural areas, uh, which are not able to find any uh, skilled IT uh, uh, employees for their organization. Uh, another issue, uh, which is also uh, pushed currently by the German government, is uh, digital transformation. Uh, even here in rural areas uh, in Germany, where most of the Mittelstand companies are uh, based in, uh, they don't have the right partners uh, to digitize their processes. That is also something I think where uh, Indian companies can benefit from. And of course, we have uh, uh, currently also a growing competition in the domestic market and, uh, uh, and not such a strong economy. So uh, it could be also very beneficial when Indian companies partner with German companies to basically uh, uh, conquer new markets. Yeah. So at the same time in India, we uh, medium-sized businesses are facing uh, completely different challenges, uh, limited capital and knowledge, non-availability of uh, suitable technology, low production capacity. So uh, this is, I think, uh, uh, which we even saw during the pandemic uh, where uh, German companies can really benefit when they enter the Indian market. So. Uh, before I talk too much about uh, the collaborations, um, uh, I think the, the partnership with, uh, uh, with FIKI uh, is uh, a, a really a best practice of such partnerships. Um, uh, it is a, a collaborations overall are a great way of developing business in new markets and to create synergies with new business potentials. Uh, but uh, this requires also lots of commitment, efforts and patience. And uh, uh, when we entered into a collaboration with FIKI in 2016, we achieved uh, a lot of uh, successful uh, goals. Uh, however, this year we turned this uh, uh, formal agreement into a very impactful uh, partnership uh, by putting together uh, the effort to uh, bring oxygen concentrators uh, to India. Uh, and uh, uh, we are very glad that uh, we are working with FIKI and uh, we are also glad that our members are benefiting from this cooperation. And uh, uh, we hope that we can continue this uh, uh, approach. And uh, uh, at the same time, we also uh, invite uh, the participants. Uh, and I saw also in the chat that some of them are looking for collaborations. So. Don't hesitate, just uh, get in touch with us and we are very glad to help you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel, for as always very smartly wording uh, the, the collaboration possibilities. Uh, thank you once again. And yes, we do cherish this partnership with Bay4MB um, a lot. 
and and uh, uh, and uh, just to uh, just to I, I would like to add one thing from my side uh, in response to what Dr. Monhart said that you know uh, I mean he was surprised to see the first Indo-German Mittelstand Business Summit. Mm. Uh, so. Uh, our side, uh, you know, uh, we can assure him that uh, definitely this is the beginning and uh, we'll only go upwards from the, from the, here. So with this, uh, uh, so thank you, Daniel. Once again, uh, I would now like to invite our, our next uh, speaker who happens to be the first keynote speaker for today, Mr. Indrajit Singh, Vice President and Region Head DAH at l and Sub Technology Services. Mr. Singh is responsible for defining the business vision and execution of roadmap for the dark region for LNT. He is a seasoned uh, executive with extensive experience of 20, 40, 28 years in building and nurturing successful technology and engineering businesses. He will share his thoughts on globalization through digitalization. Uh, but before uh, Mr. Singh, I invite you to speak. I am receiving uh, some messages offline that people are having difficulty in joining, uh, especially on LinkedIn. Uh, so people who are, uh, if you can just uh, share this message with people who want to join on LinkedIn, that they need to register on the link that I have just posted on, on LinkedIn. Okay, I'm, I'm so sorry, uh, Mr. Singh, for eating into your time. Please, this is yours. Okay. So, Pallavi, thank you very much. Uh, I will need the presentation, right? So, if you can uh, share with me. Um, sure. Um, uh, Rajkumar Ji, uh, can you please uh, give Mr. Sen presenting rights? Yeah, sorry, ma'am. Uh, um, can you please uh, give uh, Mr. Sen presentation rights? So I still don't have for the video sharing that. Yeah, let me quickly check. I uh, yes, you should have it now, Mr. Sen. Not yet. Not yet. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, now yeah, can yeah, try here. Please check. Please check, sir. Yes. Now I have got it. One second. Great. Thank you, Aman. Visible? Yes, perfect. Yes, okay. Okay, thank you very much. So, a very uh, good morning to uh, to all of you in Germany and a uh, very good afternoon to all of you in India. So, I will, uh, uh, and first of all, thank you very much, Piti, uh, for arranging this uh, event. And I think it's a very important topic uh, of uh, globalization through digitalization. And I'll express uh, uh, what has been our experiences through the uh, through the different pro programs and experiences what we have with the customers here in Germany. So uh, so I am heading the business of LNT uh, Group here in in Germany. So uh, LNT just a few words about the company. It's a it's one of the leading engineering and uh, and uh, manufacturing and infrastructure organization from India. And it's operating over uh, 30 countries, a uh, nation building company led by uh, technology, and it is equipped for growth for almost more than eight decades now. So LTTS, uh, which is LMP Technology Services. Yeah, so LMP Technology Services. So we are a digital company with having the engineering DNA. So if you look at the focus for us are on the six future depths, uh, which are all driven by technology and innovation. So I think we have touched upon a few parts already in the morning uh, session. So uh, if you take right from electric propulsion to sustainability, 5G uh, connectivity, smart manufacturing, uh, digital twin, then autonomous vehicles and robotic uh, automation. So these are the future bits where 
most of the companies, whether large organizations or middle stand companies, are, are focused into. Now, what we are observing over the past uh, few years, and this is very uh, interesting, that there are several new business models which have emerged for companies across the board in all sectors. So there are these are all very disruptive in nature, and they have become need of the hour. So you know, right from customer experience. Uh, to speed up the market uh, and uh, intelligence and new business uh, models which are erupting. So if you look at customer experience, so this has taken a lead. So today, uh, a motor OEM goes beyond on planning to how I can own the entire boating experience for customers. Similarly, you know, learning from the pand pandemics, future proofing has become very critical. So how the companies are thinking in terms of how can I architect a smart manufacturing process that allows to switch from semi-automated to fully automated mode. Uh, and, and, and of course, the speed and time to market is key. So companies are thinking of deploying 5G solutions across their 5,000 sites across the globe at the same time. And of course, uh, if you look at the new business models, uh, I think product as a service has become very prominent today. So cars are being shared via apps. The companies are also trying to evolve to productize industrial platforms and get third party developers to build solutions on top of them that enable better collaboration. We have seen you know, uh, Skywise from Airbus, then Catina, a uh, network which has been launched by the German government. So these are some of the marketplace where it, it opens up all small and larger companies to bring their own solutions and see how they can collaborate together, uh, which will bring a much more uh, business perspective from them for them. So similarly, I think omnichannel adaptation as well as intelligence, for example, how can uh, a medical equipment company increase their market uh, aftermarket revenue by monitoring global usage through AR VR? So I think these are the new technologies which are coming in and showing off new business models for, for all the companies today. Now, globalization has been there for decades now. So if we look at traditionally, uh, most of the companies had uh, tried to go uh, far east or become global predominantly for either product localization or for cost advantage or for a better time to market. But today, I think the current pandemic, along with the new technology advancements and the go global mantra, I think this has brought in a complete new globalization challenge. I mean, if you look at uh, business continuity and uh, sustainability, these were the two biggest challenges since last year. And I'm sure a lot of SMEs who are not global today in both the countries, they had uh, gone through uh, a tremendous uh, problem in in finding solutions of how to sustain. And on top of that, I think fast changing uh, global trends of urbanization driven by the social media, online platforms, mobile apps, then uh, the, uh, the, uh, the multi-channel digital sales. So these are something new, uh, which, uh, uh, which has to be imbibed very fast by the companies. Now, what is this giving up? So this is bringing also a lot of competition which are emerging across the world. So a lot of startups are coming in and they are coming up with a lot of alternative business models. And hence the companies have to think, how do they adapt to that? And, 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 and last but not the least, I think cybersecurity threats is a natural byproduct which are coming out because of these uh, technology trends. So with this background, it is clear that future growth in globalization usually will depend on the digital services, on the data, R&D, uh, on strong ICT setup. And above all, I think a, a, a cross-border global integration is, is critical uh, in order to imbibe into the organizations. So I'm sure a lot of these companies, as we heard earlier, they have uh, set up their centers in Eastern Europe, but they have also set up in India and, and I think there is a growing uh, move as we can see. Now, you know, since we are speaking about India, I thought I'd, I'll bring up a, a few points about what India provides today in terms of uh, the digital expertise. I think it holds, as you can see, almost 55% of global digital 
market share in terms of uh, a strong IT and engineering workforce and a robust global delivery setup. Coupled with the 1200 engineering colleges, which turns out more than 350,000 engineers uh, per year. Of course, it's a huge work for the Indian uh, industry and the academia to, to see how do they make future ready for all the new digital technologies. And I think there has been several initiatives uh, within the within the country. So, so what has happened is all these Indian IT companies today, Indian IT and engineering companies, they bring in strong IT processes, having worked for more than 30 years today with global companies, uh, strong standards, training methods, transition models, flexibility. These are the strong criteria, and as a result, the Indian service providers they draw an immense advantage towards uh, building a collaborative partnership in the journey of this digital uh, globalization. So now let's look at what are the drivers for uh, the business transformation for SMEs in addressing this new opportunity landscape. So what I've done is uh, listed uh, down the imperatives based on our working experience with the Nikushta and companies. So, uh, as you can see, the next gen technologies transformation uh, are most critical and they are hurting them. And so are the disruptive business models, which I covered some time back. Because I think the market scenario is changing, the customer needs and expectations are changing. However, all these problems and models are creating opportunities for future growth. So, we and these are these growths are all coming into. Uh, whether it is in smart city or into rail business, into defense uh, sectors, into the into the mobility as a service. So these are the different areas where we can see the, the growth coming in. Hence, uh, as, as we have already heard earlier, so investing in this next gen technologies coupled with new, new business solutions. So these are key for the Christian companies to open up new cross-industry business opportunities. What you create for an industrial company today is being used in the mobility sector. What you create in the telecom sector today is getting introduced in, in, the, in the infotainment and in-flight entertainment of aircrafts. So I think there is a, a, a cross-industry technology which has to be developed by most of these middle stand companies. So it will allow them to survive and grow in the larger markets. So for example, if I take the smart cities, and as we know, because LNT is, is doing a lot of smart cities in India, so a lot of SME companies here have created smart parking solutions. They are building energy solutions or security solutions. And I'm sure uh, these platforms and solutions which they have created and already deployed in, in cities in Germany, these will accelerate the deployment of, uh, of, of such programs in the smart cities in India. And it's a win-win for, for both the countries and, and the companies. It does not have to stop here, and I think all the sectors bring in such opportunities today. So as we heard already in the morning, so Mitustan companies form the nucleus of the German industry. It's about 99% of the companies and 52% of the economy. Um, we also heard in India as well, there is a growth of this SME companies uh, coming up in India, and it's critical to see that how the how the companies from both the com uh, countries can collaborate. And I'm sure digitalization is not new here in Germany uh, here for the little stand companies. However, there are challenges to adopting and enhancing the digitalization process. And this is where I think the middle stand companies board are at a juncture thinking, what do I need to do now? So there are, there are topics in digital skills, global centers, the government policies, automation, security, technology. So there are a lot of uh, topics which come in. So these are something which, which are very difficult for the small CXO board of middle stand companies to plan investments and remain specialized in their own market. However, if, if we can, if we, if we see that way back in 2011, uh, the, the federal ministry here in Germany had uh, set up the middle stand 4.0 uh, 
uh, digital SMEs. And I'm sure uh, they have implemented the digital processes. A lot of them have done for ways to safeguard and enhance their competitiveness. But does the journey end here? I don't think so. Or we don't think so. Uh, because as part of their further scale up in, in going digital, it is important that there are uh, that 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 they imbibe these five points quite fast. So one Firstly, I think increasing the digital agility. So building digital resilience, especially for customer experience and their supply chain and digital operations. Next is the leveraging cloud. So whether it is private cloud or public cloud, cloud, it also depends on the business needs of the, of the companies. Third, I think being more data driven. So pandemics have taught that already for a lot of manufacturing companies that investing in IoT platforms connecting machines and robots, helping in remote monitoring, uh, uh, predictive maintenance, AR, VR, these are very important parts. When customer experience need to improve and evolve and differentiating them, competition is critical. And finally, I think rethinking on the business model, partnerships is key. And this is where partnering with startups and academia, technology companies is critical for adopting the going digital far faster. Now the key uh, to be being successful and reinventing this business process is through the internal evolution and managing the, the change is the key and the ultimate. So this is the most difficult part. So age and reluctance to change or adopt is big here in Europe. And the people in metal stand companies are highly specialized and they're trained uh, and they're they are very niche. However, changing the mindset and the culture of the team through these three digital personalities uh, is, is key. So how do we engage with the, with the employees to train and get the right productivity out by using the new tools like AR, VR, CAD drawing, uh, uh, rather than CAD drawings, processes and systems, and using the digital tools to engage with their customers. So uh, what do we look today and beyond? So, uh, I have picked up a few examples of what we have been doing in LNT uh, to, uh, to to write from the uh, clean energy to sustainability. So we use a lot of uh, new age technology initiatives that we engage cross industry using cross leverage solutions. So uh, right from the clean energy working with uh, with the fuel cells and the wind energy companies to to see how we uh, work on the industrial side with the charging solutions. Uh, with the charging companies to creating low fa and fast uh, charging solutions, integrate that with the hybrid as well as electric car, and then of course in the autonomous and connected uh, cars, which is a growing uh, uh, thing today. And lastly, on the sustainability, so this is where we try to work uh, to achieve the government commitments for future to contribute to the Paris Climate Agreement as industry is moving towards that. So um, Mr. Sen, yeah. uh, Mr. Sen, I'm so sorry. Yeah. To inter yeah. So we have been here in Germany. We have to stay, and this is our paradigm shift. So just to complete that, is our ability to anticipate the future and react accordingly that will determine our success. Thank you for everybody to, to hear me out. Thank you, Mr. Sen. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, what LNT specializes in and and uh, how you can be of assistance for German Mittelstand company and uh, especially in in the technological uh, field. Uh, sorry for for uh, rushing you uh, through your presentation. Last few slides. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Uh, 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 so with with this uh, now, I I would uh, like to. Uh, welcome you all for a very interesting panel discussion that is waiting for us. That panel discussion will be moderated by Ms. Asha Maria Sharma, who is working as a deputy director in investor consulting digital and service industries uh, at, at Germany Trade and Investment, GTAI. Um, I would uh, give a very quick introduction of Asha so that she can uh, take over. Uh, Asha has spent very successful three years in Germany, in, in, in India, uh, when she uh, managed the agency's investor consulting office um, in, in um, India. She is now a part of the team on digital and service industries and is responsible for digitization uh, issues, AI, IoT, quantum computing, and related topics within GTAI. 
As the industry 4.2 expert, she coordinates all activities around industry 4.0 and regularly gives presentations uh, on, on uh, topics related to these. She is excellently connected within industry and uh, um, scientific institutions. Asha, uh, the, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much, Pallavi. So you can hear me clearly? Yeah. Yes, perfect. Very nice, very nice. So good morning again and good afternoon to everyone and uh, welcome to our panel Globalization through Digitalization as a part of this Mittelstand Summit. As Pallavi said, I have uh, Indo-German relations and as such, I'm really happy to be part of this summit. Um, and um, because I, I still have an ongoing affection for Indo-German relations, even though now I, <laughs> I work with many international companies. So thank you to the organizers, to Fiki and Mittelstandsverband, to you know invite such a such an interesting and an eminent group of panelists, because I feel with their contributions, uh, we all will profit to see our topic of today highlighted and discussed from very different angles. So we have two speakers with an Indian and two speakers with a German background. I would uh, I will introduce each speaker to you and ask him a first question or two to get his views on the topic and as such allowing you the audience to to get an understanding on how the panelists see the opportunities and challenges of di di digitalization sorry difficult word digitalization in their respective field of business so let's begin we have first with us today dr oliver grün oliver grün is the founder and ceo of of the grün, grün software group GmbH, which I would see as a typical German Mittelstand company. In addition, uh, Oliver has numerous roles in different organizations. He is president of the Bundesverband IT Mittelstand, BITME, and president of the European Digital SME Alliance. Since 2013, he has been appointed to the German government's Young Digital Economy Advisory Board, uh, which advises the German Federal Ministry of Economics on issues relating to the digital economy. And since 2017, he has been a member of the advisory board Digital Economy of the Federal State of North Rhine-Westphalia. Um, yeah, his background is that he has based his academic career on the principle of lifelong learning, which I really appreciate. So he graduated in engineering and went on to earn two doctorates in the field of business information systems. Um, and then as early as in 1989, he founded his software company, which now employs around 200 people at seven locations. And I wanted to mention that Oliver Grün is also the co-founder of a non-profit operator of the donation platform BetterPlace.org, which is now Germany's la largest donation portal on the internet. So, Dr. Grün, we see you today with the, like two hats on. On one hand, you're an entrepreneur and heading a typical German Mittelstand IT company. And on the other hand, you are the president of BitMe, representing a large number of IT companies, which gives you a very solid knowledge base about the needs and challenges of this group uh, regarding globalization issues. So my first question to you would be to the entrepreneur. Um, your products and services are well known in the German speaking markets. And besides Germany, you already have two European locations. What could encourage you as a Mittelstand company uh, to continue your internationalization path and look to Asia or look into the Indian market? Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, um, well, at first, I think um, when I take my hat as an <laughs> entrepreneur at first, um, uh, as you have mentioned, we're a software company, so we are a Mittelstand, but we are a part of the digital economy. Um, so, first of all, for me, it's very important to understand that in Germany we have uh, also a Mittelstand-driven digital economy and not only driven by, let's say, um, uh, Facebook and Google or something else. <laughs> Um, and of course, we, we have uh, goals and we have the goal to conquer markets. This is, um, of course, not so easy in Europe because in Europe we have uh, 26 different tax systems, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, languages, a lot of cultures mm -hmm. and small countries. And so I think it's, it's very interesting for us also to uh, um, internationalize to um, bigger uh, markets. And I think that India is great and very, very interesting market also 
um, belonging uh, to to the yeah to the, to the market itself. And if we combine this with um, the classical approach to go to India as an outsourcing uh, nation, let's say it like this, because it's global leader in IT outsourcing, um, uh, it can be very, very interesting and uh, it can be uh, really fostering um, uh, this um, approach. Um, because um, um, I think we must put these two approaches uh, together to see it on one hand as a very good extended workbench for software development, because we have a, we have a big skills shortage um, uh, of IT professionals in Germany. We have this problem in our company. We have around uh, 15 jobs which are open right now. So we are searching uh, as a small company with only 200 employees, we are searching 15 people. Mostly development skills are needed. Uh, and in Germany, we have 100,000 of uh, um, people, 100,000 uh, open jobs. And so um, I think the second thing is um, that we um, that we are searching these people on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, uh, we want to um, conquer markets. And we must uh, combine this and not only see the outsourcing uh, um, situation, we must see the second approach and then um, it will get uh, in progress, I think. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I mean, in fact, for filling in these jobs, uh, as far as I know, there's a, the largest number of international students, for example, in Germany come from India. So that might be a source with a <laughs> very knowledgeable people. Uh, Dr. Rin, if we now take the other head as the president of the BitMe Association, um, maybe you can explain a little bit how the asso association supports the member companies with internationalization or globalization topics. And um, are there any specific questions or challenges that are regularly addressed by your member companies? Yeah, um, in, in BitMe, um, uh, we represent around 2000 of companies like mine. Mm -hmm. um, so, software uh, manufacturer or IT service companies uh, based in Germany. Um, and of course, uh, we have um, very a lot of challenges. One of the most challenge of all um, our members is, of course, the skills shortage. So, this mm -hmm. is an approach and I know some who are working with outsourcing partners in India mm -hmm. because um, it, it is the biggest market for software outsourcing and for uh, highly skilled software outsourcing. Um, uh, um, so this is this is uh, of course a challenge we have. Um, but um, on the other hand, we see ourselves as a kind of entrepreneurial association, and we want to uh, foster the good business of our companies. And they all have um, uh, um, the um, challenge to internationalize because a lot of German companies are based in the German, Austrian and Switzerland market. It's, it's a classical border you have uh, following the language or whatever. I don't know. So um, this is really, this is really uh, um, yeah, the same like in my company. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's uh, highly, we, we are really, um, it's, it's a highly growing uh, um, people and highly growly, growing um, companies we have. Um, but we are looking for new target markets for our mm -hmm. products, all of us, all software mm -hmm. companies and IT and digital companies uh, in, in Germany. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously that is something we have been discussing, uh, um, the, the former speakers also highlighted that it's maybe as well the case, you can see the business, but sometimes it's really difficult to do these, to find the right approach or to meet the right people. So some it's like this one, and, and maybe there are other examples, um, other events, conferences that might be helpful for your um, member companies to, to just, yeah, get a floor yeah. and, and try to interact. We have we have good experiences with let's say cooperation. Mm -hmm. So we say um, sometimes we say cooperate or die. So um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think perhaps for for India SMEs can bundle resources uh, or IT SMEs can bundle resources to open let's say a kind of offshore development centers uh, in Indian software hubs or something like that um, together as as German companies. Um, uh, um, because you often have a 
problem of translating the processes which should be developed in software um, apps. Um, and, and I think the communication is, is a big challenge we have with yeah. outsourcing partners. And also the communication is a big challenge to understand what 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 products can be uh, fit to the Indian market, to the population of 1.3 billion people. So yeah, yeah. All this is communication, and so this is a right. good approach here with this conference. But we must go further on. on the, it must be concrete. We are Mittelstand, yeah. and for Mittelstand, it must be a concrete approach. And we are open mm -hmm. for this. Yeah. Yeah. Great, that's the first step, the openness. Thank you, uh, Dr. Grün. So now maybe let's travel over to India to Mr. B. Joy George from HCL Technologies, one of the Indian giants. B. Joy, let me quickly introduce you. You are a very experienced global and strategic business leader in the product development and engineering and outsourcing industry. Um, your experience and expertise include strategic planning, the business incubation, strategy development and execution and sales and marketing, and as well acquisitions and M&A in various verticals. Uh, you're currently the executive vice president transformation initiatives at HCL Technologies and in uh, Bijoy is in his role responsible for driving growth initiatives in the engineering and R&D services line of business. Um, yeah, his background, his academic background is in physics and mechanical engineering from Birla Institute of Technology. And then he did a postgraduate degree in management by IIM Bangalore. So, and from his bio, we can see that Bijoy is a leader who can work with and motivate individuals and teams across different ethnics and, and with a different cultural background, which is probably very helpful in your, um, in your current work. Bijoy, you have an outstanding international experience and are now with an Indian technology giant with uh, with operations here in Germany. So I assume that your customer base are mainly larger enterprises, but as uh, HCL is in Germany since many years, you probably work as well with Mittelstand or for Mittelstand customers here. And, and do you see any differences in establishing business relations to larger or Mittelstand companies? Hello, everybody. Uh, first, uh, thank you very much, uh, Pallavi, Fiki, and the organizers for giving me this opportunity to be a panelist uh, here. Hello, Asha Maria. <laughs> to come to your question, um, you know, typically most large Indian technology companies prefer to work with large customers mm -hmm. because every year you need to grow, your revenue has to grow. So if you engage with a large customer, you can grow the revenue, the engagements with the customer, you can provide additional services, you know, uh, go to different functions in the customer organization, and something which started with 10 people can go to 100 people, maybe even 1,000 people. So, by nature, the sales folks in large technology companies like the one I work in, HCL, we prefer to go for large end customers. So, therefore, Personally, I haven't had much experience interacting with Mittelstand companies in Germany, but that first one I interacted with, and this was because of a personal connect. A friend of mine from the industry moved to a Mittelstand, which is based out of Gifon, HMD. And while HMD would normally not have been a typical client profile for HCL, we decided that we will we let's talk. Let's try and set up uh, an offshore development center in India for HOD, which is what the initial discussions were. But it very quickly went into investment discussions. Would you like to invest in HOD? Would you like to buy HOD? And that's when this discussion went completely into an acquisition. Today, HOD is a HCL <laughs> technologies company. And we realized, I personally realized the number of gems, such gems we have in Germany in the middle stands, which we are unfortunately, and I say we, I, I speak about myself and I think uh, a large representative of Indian uh, executives who have been, who are based in Germany or with Germany. It's only recently we came to know about the different kind of companies in the Middle East. We all knew about the Middle East. We knew that, you know, they're the gems, they are the backbone of the German economy. The problem okay. was still now. See, now is a relative word, could be the last uh, the last couple of years to three years. The thinking was that we can do all this ourselves. We've gone to the US and expanded and done business by ourselves. We've gone to UK. So EU should not be too different. 
But the problem is you have to know the German language. It's not enough to do a, you know, the speak a little bit worse, minor Deutsch, überhaupt nicht gut sprechen Sie English. It doesn't get you too far. You need to know the business discussion level of German. And even though English is a common language, you cannot build, see many speakers spoke about building that trust. You cannot build that trust if you cannot converse easily. You need to mm. understand the language. The other option for Indian companies was to go to private equity investment banks and ask, hey, if you are interested in an acquisition, you want to like, you know, meet such customers. I realized that there is relatively low awareness amongst large private equity and investment banks, et, et cetera, the, you know, the international ones, about the middle stand companies in Germany because they're typically smaller and any deal size which may happen, any interaction which may happen there, the ticket size would be much smaller than if you were to mm. go for a billion dollar acquisition. Mm. And I found out that it is boutique investment banks, the financial institutions in Germany who manage the family wealth of, see most middle stands are actually entrepreneurs, they own the company, it's their money, their wealth, and it's managed by these boutique investment banks, etc. who are the ones who know about the gems and the hidden gems out there. So. A small secret I'm telling you, I now interact with these boutique investment banks and the smaller local <laughs> private equity to find out who are those interesting middle stands out there. Okay. And this <laughs> is vice versa. There's a low awareness about what Indian tech companies mm. can do for the German middle stand companies because of this lack of awareness. So oh, yeah. uh, it's been <laughs> a new discovery right now, but it was, you know, we're still learning how to go about yeah. engaging with middle stand. Well, wow, thank you, Bijoy. Very, very interesting. I mean, as an invest, in, being in the investor consultancy, I would rather prefer you coming and opening up your business and not buying the our hidden uh, champions. But nevertheless, maybe <laughs> there are offers to to partner as well. I, it, it does that. So, if I may respond to that, Asha, we did, we did this. We did this just for expanding our business because we realized yeah, yeah, that yeah. we need to have a German face in Germany. We can't do the business <laughs> with Indians coming from India. Yeah. So we flipped it from about 150 Germans out of a total of 500. Now we have 1,500 Germans out of a total of 2,000 people in Germany. Thank you, Vijay, for sharing your views on that. Very, very interesting, right? Uh, yeah, what I learned from you here. And uh, maybe we can just continue with another view um, from an India headquartered company with a global footprint. Uh, because at this time, we have the good fortune to have with us Mr. Pankaj Sate from KPIT. Um, KPIT is a global technology company with software solutions, uh, mainly for the automotive world, I would say. Mr. Pankaj Sate is the head of the Europe business in KPIT and um, he's a member of the executive board as well. He's responsible for executive connect with key customers, the sales, on-site operations, people development and the branding and positioning of the organization as a key technology expert within KPIT's focused industry verticals. Um, Pankaj has over 25 years of experience in establishing sales, market, marketing and operations in new geographies, integrating quiet companies, a bit like Bejoy, so <laughs> partnering with customers and developing value generating propositions for them. He uh, has participated in the growth of CAPIT globally and especially been instrumental for CAPIT's growth in Europe where he successfully established a local presence and expanded the business organically as well as inorganically. Pankaj is an electronics and telecommunications engineer from Delhi College of Engineering and as well has an MBA from IIM in Lucknow. Um, he has been a member of the IEEE and supports the IIM Alumni Association in Europe. Pankaj, where are you? Can we switch? to your picture. <laughs> KPIT is headquartered in India, but with several international subsidiaries. And I would be interested to learn which paths did KPIT follow to internationally expand? Was it rather technology driven or customer driven? How did you do these steps? And the second question would be, does KPIT have experiences in working or cooperating with Mittelstand companies in India or Germany? So, can we? Thank you, Asha. Are you able to see me? Hear me? I can hear you very clearly. Now I can see you. Very good. Thank okay. you. Excellent. <laughs> Thank Excellent. you. All right. 
So guten Morgen and uh, thank you for inviting me. Asha also Pallavi and Tiki to this very interesting panel discussion. Uh, some very, I would call it erudite thoughts, you know, that already came up. Uh, I was listening in already. Uh, so it's, I think, turning out to be extremely engaging. So thank you for the questions. Uh, if I were to share my experiences, uh, I would say that as KPIT, we ourselves are actually a product of uh, globalization through digitalization. Uh, the specific questions that you asked, you know, about whether we are technology driven or customer driven in terms of how we grew our business. I would say that our primary driver is, of course, technology. We are a technology company in engineering, but we are also customer obsessed. That's how I would describe ourselves and our profile. Uh, when we set out to expand, uh, because, you know, we came out of not even a metro, as it's called, one of the large cities in India. Naturally for us, the resources were limited and so also the access to actually expand our business outside of where we were, not just in India, but even globally. Mm -hmm. And I think it is the digital technologies which actually enabled us to grow our business and to service our customers. So when I look at the customer acquisition or the customer delivery or the customer care process. When I look at all the three processes, I think it's digitalization which actually enabled us to expand our horizons and to reach out to markets which otherwise would not have been possible for us. So typically, you know, for customer acquisition, it would be all the marketing digital technologies that we employ. Uh, which essentially means we don't have to physically be in front of the customer all the time. Uh, for the customer delivery, again, you know, it's all the cloud-based work share mm. that is, I think, deployed by most of the other organizations also now. So that's what really we use to deliver from what we would call the best cost and also the best quality locations for our customers mm -hmm. in a global delivery model. Mm -hmm. And uh, last but not the least, for the customer care process, Again, it's the cloud based CRM technologies that we mm -hmm. employ in order to actually keep in touch with customers and make sure that we always are in step with the changing requirements. So I think when I look at this entire spectrum of the business that we run, uh, to me, it is really an outcome of being able to globalize through digitalization. So mm -hmm. that has been our experience and even today, uh, though we have offices now in more than 16 countries where, you know, we have our major customers for automotive engineering. Mm. Uh, the fact remains that bulk of our business model is actually based on digitalization. That's what I would say, you know, in yeah, response yeah. to the first yeah. question that you had. Uh, I think you were also keen to understand, you know, what has been our experience. I think your second part of the question was, uh, what has been our experience between uh, taking our offers to larger versus the middle stand customers? I think that was the second part yeah. of the question. Uh, so I think to me, the middle stand customers are a very key market for us, a very key segment. Uh, we do engage with many of them already uh, in Germany, and we have very long lasting relationships actually with some of them. Uh, the, the important part about the middle stand companies is the quality of the technology that they have. It is in general, you know, in their very specific segment, it's generally always the best that you would find in the world. Uh -huh. So from a pure technology expertise perspective, there is a lot of value addition in working with the middle stand companies. Also the point which I heard Indrajit make in his presentation. He talked about technologies which are actually cross domain. You know, the technology today may be in telecom, but tomorrow it may come into the digital cockpit in the car. I think this is where there is a lot of value add in working with the metal stand companies. They have technologies which can be leveraged right across. So there is a lot of value and we do engage with them very actively. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pankaj. I have one more question. Um, we have been talking about workforce and the, the some cultural differences so that German Mittelstand would probably need to talk to someone speaking and being fluent in German. Um, I mean, you're while internationalizing, you're sort of following your customers or going there where you find the customers. But, but regarding the workforce, you, I think you have a very international workforce, for example, in the new Munich based uh, center, people from more than 25 nations or so I read are employed. Um, does, does it still play a role when you open new business units? Um, where to place them, seeing that, I mean, well qualified people uh, are moving readily all over the world. Do you have, I mean, is CAPIT as such able to find all the people in the new sites? that you would uh, need to have? <laughs> Good question. Good question. So I think as the world becomes more global and diverse, you know, there is also increasing, I would call it awareness and appreciation of the local nuances. So hmm. for sure, it does help. Uh, and I agree with what, you know, a colleague from HCL said, the language factor is very important, particularly in some of the European countries. My experience has been that as long as you have a dedicated front end which mm -hmm. can engage with the customer in the local language and it is typically only to understand what the customer's requirements are what we find is that while they may not be able to think in english mm -hmm. when they express their requirements uh, at an operating level language is not such a showstopper mm -hmm. It's only that initial part, you know, where they want to tell you what exactly they want. That's where, you know, the language does come into play. If you have a very capable front end and it's only a few people that you really require that can engage with the customer for this initial phase of mm -hmm. understanding what's in the customer's mind. I think the rest of the process is non-language specific to a large okay. extent. So it does not really matter. And in Thank any you. case, what we have done is yeah. we have made sure that bulk of the people that we have in Germany, even if they are not German, they are at least German speaking. Because that we okay. have tried to ensure. Super. Thank you so much, Pankaj, for sharing uh, your your experiences sure. and your your views. So maybe let's travel back uh, from India or, uh, over to Germany again, and let's shift a little bit um, because now we have with us to highlight the latest from Germany's R&D and information platform German Digital Technologies. We have with us uh, Cedric Amon. Cedric joined the forum Digitale or Digital Technologies in 2021 as a project manager for international affairs and now he's responsible for the promotion and connection of government funded projects ranging very uh, from a very large range from quantum computing to smart farming. So all the topics of digitalization that we're discussing here. Before joining the forum, Cedric completed a blue book traineeship at the EU Directorate General for Competition in a specialized AI unit. And then prior to this, to this he worked for Diplo Foundation and Geneva Internet Platform, which is a digital policy, policy observatory in Geneva. Cedric. Um, the German Digital Technologies Organization is, is a platform to present new digital technologies. So you, in your work, are covering the field of R&D, uh, supporting as well the market entry for new technologies and young companies, right? And the second question would be, your clients or the projects you are highlighting, you're presenting, do you see your clients and partners cooperating internationally? Well, uh, thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. Yes. Yes. Okay. So thank you, Asha Maria, for the kind introduction and thank you for the organizers uh, for having me in the, this very interesting uh, panel and conversation we're having. Um, so first about the forum, the forum digital technologies is a was conceived as a complementary uh, program aside to the technology digital technology programs of the Ministry of Economy. So we've been operating since 2019. Um, we had a predecessor, which was the Smart Data Forum, which worked on similar topics. And there, as you mentioned uh, already, 
we are networking and exhibition space to promote the results of the projects of the ministry that are, are funded and, and supported by the ministry. And we offer outstanding research projects, a platform for more visibility, but also work on the knowledge transfer of their results into SMEs. Um, we do this by, uh, by having a, an exhibition space in the heart of Berlin, which is actually a showroom, which is now being virtualized, um, which I can highly recommend if you have uh, events and um, or delegation visits. This is a space that is made especially for that, to create connections to, you can host events and, and, and conferences and workshops there, um, which is also enriched with uh, about 20 demonstrators from, um, well, usually R&D projects or um, by, by organizations or usually groups of organizations that are just about uh, to enter in the, in the German Mittelstand, as you would say. And these are organized around Internet of Things, big data, artificial intelligence, and security, et cetera. Okay. Um, Cedric, I mean, yeah, you have a large international exposure, as I understand. Would you have maybe uh, an example or two for, yes. for international corporations in this R&D field? Of course. <laughs> um, I think one that is quite interesting and has a direct connection to India would be uh, ACM, Adaptive City Mobility. Maybe some of you have heard about it. It is a project that started in 2013 in um, as part of a uh, government funded uh, project um, and was then prolonged and became a lighthouse project of the government. What that meant is they were slowly able to build and, um, and, 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 and uh, improve the technology. They had a product which is basically an electric mobility car but also works on a business to business platform because it has also an important software component. Mm -hmm. um, and there, as they were growing and with the different market opportunities they had, they found partners in India and have then uh, developed and have been invited there to showcase their project and have then since also found uh, investment partners and also uh, production partners um, in India which is kind of the idea um, also a bit behind of the forum that we're trying to, to channel these synergies and where we can uh, help or projects of the government to promote themselves abroad. I mean, we're not necessarily in the business to business uh, connection then, mm -hmm. but um, just to establish that first link, I would say. Um, yes. Super. Thank you so much, Cedric. I. I have an eye on the uh, on the time, so yes, <laughs> no problem. I and and I would like I, I have a huge list of questions that I would really like to ask <laughs> all of all of you. But as uh, as um, Mr. Satya is uh, restricted in his time, I would now profit to maybe give all of you the opportunity to to give me a quick answer to one um, last question, the same question for everybody. And Mr. Satya, if you are still there and if you would have the time to to give me an answer. If you would be the minister for digitalization in, in your home country, in your country, you would please name me one idea to <laughs> support globalization or support digitalization. Is there one thing that comes to your mind immediately? Okay, so <laughs> I'll go first because I unfortunately <laughs> would have to leave. So thank you for giving me the first opportunity. Uh, what I would think uh, top of my mind, you know, if there can be um, a secure digital platform mm -hmm. uh, that can be created by, you know, the likes of Wiki. Uh, it gives a lot of credibility and it gives confidence, you know, to both the buyers and sellers of metal stand companies to come together. So you can have the metal stand companies that want certain products or services to mm -hmm. be able to come to this digital platform, platform. Uh -huh. with confidence and then you can have the sellers also middle stand who can come to this portal with confidence because they know these are qualified buyers and mm -hmm. ideally if we can have also a buddy system because <laughs> while they may want to actually buy and sell it's also not knowing how to actually go about it and there are many companies like I said you know we ourselves have grown through the same route so, so yeah. I mean I myself oh. would be very happy, you know, to tell somebody how to go about 
actually okay. working with a metal stand company in germany so okay. i'm sure if you can also offer this buddy feature so a company mm-hmm. which can partner with you and show you how to go through this process i think that can help a lot that would be my yes. wish thank you Hi. thank you so much pankaj um thanks so I'm... much <laughs> Now I think Dr. Grün, I would like you to I would like you to answer the question: What would you do if you would be the minister for digitalization, and if this topic would not be shared between different ministries like it is now in Germany? <laughs> what would be your idea? Yeah, uh, to be honest, I have I have a, I have a lot of ideas for this uh, case. Um, uh, All together, I think we need a mindset change uh, pro digitalization in, in Germany. So mm-hmm. enable digital business mo- models don't uh, pro- prohibit them. Um, of course, we have a lot of problem with growth, uh, investment, money. So I, I would, um, let's say, uh, start a kind of stock exchange for technology companies without too much bureaucracy. So perhaps like Nasdaq uh, Germany. <laughs> um, and of course, I, I would I would really make the state legally obligated to digitize so not only saying and discussing but um, make it force it really force it so i think there that's enough for the first <laughs> ten minutes. Okay. thank you yeah it'll need some time to be realized anyway be joy joy how about you what would you do if you would be the minister for digitization First, I'm going to transfer to Germany and be the Minister of Digitalization for Germany. <laughs> the first thing I would do, this is based on the COVID experience, is I would completely digitalize Germany's healthcare system, whether it's improving of diagnosis, better workflow information management, better power computing, convenient delivery of the care through smartphones, smart devices, wider access to healthcare, There's a whole bunch. Mm. And I would, in, I would involve the, all the middle stars who can play a role in this. Something which uh, is not, maybe, maybe not well known, C3i is a Bulgarian company. It's a very small company which HCL acquired. C3i is responsible for the handling and logging of all medical inquiries, complaints, uh, adverse events, et cetera, the product quality for everybody who's been vaccinated with the BioNTech uh, <laughs> Pfizer vaccine in Germany. We have more than 50 people working on that. It's a small wow. company enabled by HCL. We use the same uh-huh. thing. So yeah. middle stand companies in Germany can play a big role if driven federally to completely yeah. digitalize the German healthcare system. That's what I would do with our okay. <laughs> Thank you, Bijoy. Very concrete proposals mm-hmm. you have there. <laughs> and last but not least, Cedric. Uh, you, thank you. Uh, with a different angle, different background, maybe different generation. What's your view yes, on that? Yes, definitely. You I... <laughs> I think I have a something a bit similar to uh, Bidroy's uh, proposal I, because I don't have as something as concrete. But my turn would be not virtualized processes that are working in the analog world. It is not enough to just uh, make a PDF out of a form. But really, we have this Mittelstand. We have this capacity to see many different technologies, but they can also be used cross-sectorally. So if we, we talk about the agricultural sector, yes, we have sensors and we have high quality specificity mm-hmm. in that. But if you add someone who's from the banking sector, you can have new business models, new business proposals that are user centric. I think that is the, the, the ultimate goal that I would go for um, to really put uh, users and, and, and customers at the center of, of new developments. Thank you. Thank you, Cedric. In fact, thank you all for uh, being part of this panel discussion. Um, I hope that we can continue Pallavi because I'm really looking forward to exchanging views with um, this audience and with this group of panelists further. What we've very clearly seen that there are some concrete ideas on how to encourage better knowledge and cooperation between Indian and German Mittelstand companies, um, as well as maybe to conquer new markets jointly. And um, I think we all know, me as well, that this is an ongoing exercise and it asks all of us to to bring in willingness, to bring in knowledge and to, you know, like the beauty of intercultural exchanges, because it's not always easy. But uh, if you continue if working on it, then you will reach your goal. And it will be very interesting to see where we will stand in a few years regarding this globalization through digitalization.
So again, thank you to all the speakers today. Thank you, gentlemen, I have to say, because it's a pure male panel, and uh, to all of us who joined us today. And now please stay tuned for the next panel from today's organizers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asha. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Um, thank you. <laughs> bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, all the panelists for joining and being a part of this summit. Thank you, Asha. We really, uh, you know, uh, uh, as I said in the morning, this is just the beginning, and we really uh, look forward to continuing this dialogue. Uh, you know, probably we can create a separate session with especially the uh, panelists <laughs> because I know they are, uh, they have amazing experience and they have such wealth of information that I can go on and on with them <laughs> and then just listen to their their thoughts. Uh, amazing. Thank you once again, Asha, for uh, moderating this session so efficiently. All right. So so uh, with this, uh, you know, we it's time for our second uh, keynote speaker. I would like to welcome Mr. Norman Denton, Chief Executive Officer, Wirth Industrial Services India Private Limited. He is having over 21 years of experience in the sales field uh, in five different countries, Germany, UAE, Jordan, China, and India. From a key account manager to CEO, his journey has been incredible. Mr. Denton has been in India since 2014. He is also a lecturer at the University of Technology, Business, and Design, Constance. Um, uh, for, for, for the subject systemized sales processes. Please welcome Mr. Dental, who will share his perspective on entry and expansion strategy through partnership and collaborations. Uh, Mr. Dental, the screen is yours now. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I prefer to speak rather than showing a presentation because the time is short. Yeah, otherwise, we could continue for hours most likely. So, first of all, thank you very much for having me. Interesting topics, especially with the digitalization. I believe this whole digitalization topic in Germany would start with the increase of the bandwidth, yeah, which is really lacking in Germany, which would be a good start. And then, obviously, also congratulations to everyone who is participating here. It shows that you are either in India already or you have interest in going to India, expanding your business in India, or settle in India. So the topic entry and expansion strategy in India and Germany through collaboration is obviously something very important because when we I'm talk now from a German perspective, if we come to a different country, we need support. And this is not just the support of, a let's say, a joint venture, a partner, but also legal support and also, also cultural support, which is also something very important. And uh, for me, as someone who grew up in Germany, I had to learn a lot by being abroad for the first time. But you get used to it and it shows once more also how important it is to have a local partner for all your needs in order to support you. And as rightly said, I am um, from WIRT. I'm the CEO of WIRT Industrial Services in India. I believe that most of you have heard about WIRT. For those who have not heard about the company yet, it's basically the market leader for assembly material worldwide with an annual turnover of 14.41 billion euros in 2020 and we managed quite well through the pandemic also that we had even a slight increase of one percent um, in 2020 compared to 2019 which was really good and what is the picture in india so word came to india nearly 30 years ago with the first entity now we have six legally independent entities in india and um, some of them are working in their core business the core business of word is the sales of assembly material. What we do at World Industrial Service, we provide different type of services and vending machines, Kanban, capacity as such, so also warehousing and vendor managed inventory to our industrial customers. So in saying so, this is not easy for customers to establish in India. So they also need a partner in the same fashion like we needed a partner. They needed a partner who can support them locally and still need partner and reliability. So this is something where we support all companies who are in the manufacturing segment or the assembly segment all across India with systems. And within the systems, we obviously provide also the material from fasteners to maintenance, repair, operation material to personal protective equipment. So but this is not the end of the journey of world in India, and as I mentioned, we started nearly 30 years ago with the mindset of expanding our core business, and a lot has happened ever since. In 2017, 
I have also started with outsourcing shared service activities in India. Now, if wherever you say the word outsourcing shared services, it still has somehow a negative uh, connotation, which is not true because with this implemented, we support internal and external clients, obviously, to focus on their core task. And this is also something that I would like to address to everyone who is participating here, to use the resources that India is having who are adding as a benefit to you, to your organizations. And when I read through the schedule of today, obviously there was mentioned with the cost reduction and cost reduction, cost reduction, but the cost reduction itself is not a major driver for us to come to India, obviously. Yeah? So it's something also for the outsourcing activities, this is one part. Yes, this is true because obviously the resources are by far lower in pricing if you compare this with other countries. But for us, the, the best thing that uh, while we're using India also for the outsourcing activity is the increase of productivities that our colleagues internally, also external clients, can focus on their core task. And you get a very, very good service quality within India because uh, there is a lot, a lot of well-trained staff and a lot of students who are finishing a university every year who are looking forward to work for a company and especially also for a German company on MNC in general. So India provides a huge opportunity of, of really onboarding the right mindset also for activities where you can't find actual workers in Germany, you have the opportunity to find those brilliant heads in India. And the next thing is also the scalability, yeah? The sheer amount of people, of resources, of possibility in India allows you obviously to onboard people very quickly. And what I have seen that we don't have to go through multiple or sometimes endless rounds of interviews, hoping that we find the right resources. You no, know, in India, you will definitely find the right resources. And if you do this also professionally, you will find the right resources also very quickly. So this is something that we are really looking into and in expanding the business. And especially these days of going away from all the manual work, Yeah, talking right now just about the outsourcing activity of shared service, going into the artificial intelligence, going into bots. So what we are also doing in India, we are generating uh, bots of RPA, robotic uh, processing um, bots who help us in order to be even more productive, to increase the productivity, to be more competitive. Because at the end of the day, our competition as well as your competition does nothing else than this. And now you might say, okay, this is nothing for me. I want to only have the employments in Germany. Then this will definitely work for the next years to come. But it will not work in the mid and long term. Because you can see a lot of companies are using those resources in India and they are not using it just handful wise, they're using it by the thousands in order to scale up their business. And if I look only talking about this one business unit that, uh, that I was just addressing of outsourcing shared services, I have started this in 2017 with eight employees. And right now we have crossed 275 full-time employees only for outsourcing. And within this year, I mean, it's a, it's a terrible year, a terrible year worldwide, but especially for India, we were able to employ 100 new employees only for this business unit with business services, so the shared service activities online. And every one of those colleagues was just spot on, was trained by our colleagues also in India and in Germany, and they are carrying out now also tasks and processes where our colleagues in Germany has to be trained for months and some of them even years. So you see, you get a very, very good mindset and the right variety of very good and nice people in India to expand the business and also good is looking forward to do so. And once again, not only in the sales field, but also in outsourcing. And another business division that I have created in India is um, the development of a CRM tool. Yeah, everyone who's working in sales has heard this name before also. And um, also this 
was really easy to get very good people on board, English speaking. And I, I forgot to mention that in our business services facility, half of the employees, they speak to do in German. Because we have all the, all the issues in Germany that at the very beginning, English is obviously no major language in Germany still. So we have to find Indian colleagues who spoke German back in the days. And now we are serving also our clients around the world with the individual language requirements, regardless if it's then French, we have someone who speaks Norway, yeah, we have people who speak Spanish and so on. So this is something which I find after being to a lot of countries in the last years, I haven't found this in another country yet. So therefore, India is obviously the right place to be. And I believe, and I've said this also in the interviews before, who is not present right now in India, I'm very doubtful if these companies will make it in, in the long run. Because even though we are worldwide the biggest reseller of assembly material, Wood itself says that we are covering only 5% of what is possible for us in the market. And um, our company, Wood Industrial Service, is located in Pune. Which one or the other might know already. And if I just take the state, Maharashtra has 120, 123 million people, yeah, the population, 123 million. In Germany, we have 82 million. So you can put the entire Germany just in one state and you have then 27 states left. So you see also the business opportunities if you do it right. What you need for India is obviously a lot of patience, a lot of patience and the right context. But then I'm very much sure that India provides everyone a beautiful platform to expand and to develop and to become successful with the colleagues, the employees, and um, yeah, whatever India has to provide above and beyond this. And this is from my side, obviously we could continue for hours as I mentioned, so whoever has interest um, to be in touch, to get more information about certain topics privately or business-wise, please feel free to reach out to me whenever you would like to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dental. That was truly awesome uh, listening to your journey in India. Uh, and yes, I do agree that, you know, uh, being a multilingual may come a little easier to Indians because, you know, it's a vast country. We have uh, over 200 uh, official languages within the country itself. So, yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that's really encouraging. And, and that too, listening it from you about your journey in India uh, is brilliant. Thank Anyways. you for having me. Thank you very much, Harvey. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, now I will, I, I'll come to the next part of, of uh, our summit today, um, a, panel, a panel discussion on the same topic. And this panel discussion will be moderated by Mr. Manoj Barve, who is the chairman of a BBMW representative office in India. Um, uh, Manoj, I'll give a very quick introduction so that I, you know, you do, you can start with your panel discussion as soon as possible. <laughs> yeah, so, so as the head of BVMW representative office in India, Mr. Barve supports cooperation between Indian and German SME, uh, SMEs at various levels, like technical and commercial collaborations, joint ventures and business uh, development. Manoj has over 25 years of experience uh, with a career footprint uh, across several countries. He has, he has worked uh, uh, at uh, uh, Alpha Laval India, held similar positions at, at Thyssen Krupp India, Hydro Aluminium Deutschland in Malaysia, Eton, CEAG, Jishad Heights Technik, ITT, Richter, Shemi Technik, and uh, PwC in Germany and uh, J. McDermott uh, in, in Dubai. So uh, over to you. And, and before I end, uh, Manoj has uh, uh, an extensive cross-cultural experience as well. So Manoj, over to you. The 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 screen is yours. Hi, thanks, Pali. Uh, good 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 talk and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining the summit. Uh, and I also give a warm welcome uh, to our panelists. Thanks for participation. And the Uh, can you hear Manoj well? Can't hear him at all. Okay. <laughs> um, 
Uh, Manoj, you may uh, want to switch off your video. Uh, it seems uh, you're having some bandwidth issue. Well, India has to do a little bit more when it comes to digitalization, it seems. Manoj, can you hear us? Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, Manoj, we can hear you now. Yeah, perfect. Awesome. Um, I'm sorry, Manoj, we lost you again. Uh, Manoj, would you like to rejoin the meeting? Let me quickly check with him. Is there any technical issue? Like, is it at my end or? Yes, Manoj, uh, we are having some technical issue at your end. Uh, would you like to switch off your camera so that we have better bandwidth? So, yeah. Is it, is it uh, am I busy? Hello? I'm audible. You I'm we audible? can hear you very well. Yes. Okay. So Please go I'll ahead. Try to shift to mobile. But, yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. Please um, carry on. So, Germany is so Germany is India's most important trading partner within European Union, and. So, most important trading partner in global comparison. Uh, Converse India only ranks 23rd. A huge uh, pile of a market of 1.3 billion population has not really been explored so far. Indian investments in Germany are also limited, partially to certain, uh, limited primarily to certain sectors. And over the next 45 um, odd minutes, we will be discussing about entry and expansion strategy in India and Germany to partnerships and collaborations at business as well as at governmental level. But first of all, let me introduce you to our esteemed panelists. As uh, alumnus of Harvard Business School, Vinit Mittal is a social entrepreneur, pioneer, and an evangelist uh, of sustainable development. Vinit has been a vanguard of clean, uh, clean energy transition in emerging economies across Asia and Africa. His passion for sustainability originates from the ancient Indian Vedic philosophy and his strong emphasis on generating clean energy has led to the creation of Avada group, of which he is also uh, the chairman. Vada in Hindi means a promise and Vinny's uh, company holds a promise of a sustainable future. Please welcome with me uh, India's solar man, Vinny Mittal. Uh, Rajesh uh, Gandhi next is the first generation entrepreneur who uh, formed uh, Stowcraft 22 years ago. Stowcraft is the largest kitchen appliance company in India. Stowcraft recently bought an IPO in the middle of the pandemic, which got oversubscribed by 18 times. Rajendra is one of the few uh, men who have a better understanding of the kitchen, and he has truly changed the kitchen appliances industry in India. Please uh, welcome uh, Rajendra. Uh, Gandhi. Is he there? Um, yep. um, okay, I'll move to the next. Uh, 
uh, state bank of india with her 200 years of uh, years old history is the largest indian bank it has a dominating presence in india serving 440 million customers which is almost equivalent to the population of european union consisting 27 countries state bank of india sbi as we call it is in frankfurt since 1974 almost 50 years uh, raghavan is the ceo of central bank of india in germany a veteran of uh, sbi Raghavan has worked uh, all over India for 30 years and in New York for five years, immediately after the global financial crisis. He is in Frankfurt since more than a year. He came here during the global pandemic crisis. He seems to be the SBI's go-to man for dealing with global crisis. Please welcome with me uh, Raghavan Srinivas. Anuj uh, is the second generation businessman a director of Premier Seals, an automotive components manufacturing company. He represents true spirit of Indian metal stand, uh, the family business and high quality industrial products. Since, Arju, uh, since Anuj entered the business, new wind is uh, blowing at Premier. He has brought in systems and processes and a blend of young energetic as well as experienced people, digitization. And most of all, he is highly focused on internationalization of his company. Uh, this Indian metal stand company is on its way to become a hidden champion as defined by Professor Dr. Herman Simon. Welcome with me, Anuj Gupta. Uh, our latest addition is uh, NJ Joseph. Uh, Joseph, uh, in addition to being senior VP and global head of uh, strategy uh, company, Scient, an engineering services company, he also serves as managing director and CEO of Science Solutions and Systems, a joint venture with Israel-based Bluebird Aero Systems that delivers UAV solution for Indian defense sector. In simple words, it means drones for our friendly neighbors. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Joseph. Uh, Joseph also played an active role in science acquisitions and integration of the business in the USA uh, Europe and India. Please welcome with me uh, NJ Joseph. Without spending uh, too much of a time, I will directly move to uh, Vinit. Um, Vinit, India, Germany recently celebrated 70 years of diplomatic relations. We have over 25,000 students studying in Germany, a number of German institutions, KFW Bank, BEG, uh, GIZ, DAD, and so on and so forth, and many think tanks working cooperating between India and Germany. Education Development Research Association, that's great. But what can be done further to improve the business cooperation? Uh, thank you, Manoj. Uh, thank you, Fikki. Uh, I think uh, from where I sit, Indo-German relations should have been a match made in heaven. If you look at historically, India was the one of the first countries to uh, grant uh, Federal uh, uh, Republic of Germany the recognition. And uh, uh, both the countries, as you rightly said, celebrated 70 years of diplomatic relationship. In fact, if you look at uh, Germany, I tend to disagree with you on partnership on the research. Uh, Fraunhofer uh, to several other uh, large institute in Germany uh, can do a phenomenal work towards uh, making India art neighbor and increase the trade balance between these two countries. Today, India imports more uh, from Germany than, uh, than we export, and we could become a manufacturing hub uh, for uh, Germany, like uh, what America did for China. Uh, we could be uh, the in same position. Uh, for Germany, we need to improve and increase a broader and deeper cooperation in area of science and technology, R&D, frugal engineering, and innovation, because those are the things which will yield into economic development in coming year. With the student exchange, we are doing a deeper level of meaningful engagement and increasing friendship and relationship, but what we need to do now is to take this relationship into the uh, next 
that uh, uh, level. I think that today the challenge is that uh, uh, that uh, German uh, Germany has a huge strategic advantage that uh, uh, they have uh, abundance and surplus in their saving, and uh, and there is a negative. Uh, uh, 0.36% uh, coupon which one makes if they invest in Germany. Whereas India is such a huge uh, opportunity and huge country where uh, government has plans to invest trillions of dollars into infrastructure. So if I have to look at, I think uh, there is a immediate opportunity uh, for Germany to look carefully whether its rule incentivize the flow of private capital into infrastructure project elsewhere and particularly in India. And if it does not, how does it create financial regulation at home that harmonizes with the partnership it announces with India? There is a... Uh, Vinit, uh, I'm going to come to you again and towards okay. the end, I will tell you because you have excellent experience with the policy makers and you have certain ideas which are more for policy makers. So I will, I will definitely come to you and I remember what you had said during our discussions. But first I will go to Joseph. Joseph, I have two questions uh, for you. Uh, we have seen Germany can make good use of Indian IT and engineering skills in industry four and other forms of digitization. You are globally serving large corporations, including Germany's Bosch, Siemens, Liebherr and many more. You have a presence in Stuttgart, Germany. So what needs to be done in order to extend our reach to German SMEs, the, the metal stand? That is first question. And I will simultaneously ask you the second question, uh, which uh, in our discussion, we you had said that Scient has strong business relationship with Germany, as well as an emotional attachment. Uh, can you please elaborate on that? To what extent emotional uh, attachment or emotional relationship matter in business world. You have experience in m and as well as in post-merger integration. So this uh, answer can be given by you. Uh, just an hour ago when uh, Dr. Jürgen Mohard, uh, the consulate general from Mumbai, German consulate general, he talked about uh, an invisible, excellent bond between our two civil societies, which we don't see, but which is underlying and which is uh, assisting a lot of relationships at business level also. So can you please uh, tell about the science uh, German connect? Uh, uh, Manoj, hopefully I'm audible to everyone and thank you. for the Yes. Yeah. Um, our association is over 20 years. You know, when I heard about this event, thousand uh, required work. All enterprises based in Stuttgart. Uh, you are you are a bit. Uh, can, can you wait loud? Can you put the sound a bit? Oh, okay. Uh, is that better? Can you hear me better? Yeah, now? it's better. Okay. Uh, so uh, I said about twenty years ago, we uh, set down a footprint in Germany because we recognize Germany and Europe for us. We acquired a company uh, that was just outside Stuttgart and Stuttgart, but since then we made our. What we were offering is uh, uh, not typical of what uh, Indian company offering then, we were not part of the Indian IT industry, created a new industry, which is uh, engineering design outsourcing. Uh, so our customers were not about, you know, IT applications and PPOs, it was more about designing rail transportation, uh, rolling stock signaling systems. It was about working with one of the largest uh, uh, aerospace uh, design companies, uh, again, with a footprint in Germany, with energy and so on and so forth. Uh, I mentioned the emotional connect because uh, uh, between 2016 and 2020, uh, Mohan Reddy, who's a founder uh, uh, and recently retired chairman of Scient, was also the honorary counsel for the Federal Repu Republic of Germany for the states of Telangana and Andhra Pradesh, where Scient was born and where Scient is headquartered. Uh, and in in his own way, uh, you know, he uh, worked uh, to uh, into a bilateral ties with areas of not just industry but education, you know, skills, innovation, and culture. So that is a very important thing. Uh, you know, we go to a country not because we want to work, bring work back to India. We go to a country because you know we can contribute uh, 
locally too in the countries that we operate and Germany in that sense has also been quite important. Uh, to the first part of your question, Manoj, I would say this, right? It's not about looking at India as just a, uh, 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 an outsourcing destination, right? We've, we, we, can, we can provide the engineering skills, we can provide that mm -hmm. scale, and we can provide uh, uh, all those good things. And that's been the traditional view of the uh, industry. But when I look at this uh, segment, the SME segment that you stun, right? uh, India is also potentially a market. And uh, a partnership, a collaboration with companies like ourselves and others and my fellow panelists on the call means, you know, this market opens up, you know, in a different way. Uh, one of the things that comes to mind is that the products that you innovate and uh, design and, you know, build in, uh, for Germany or for Europe are not necessarily the same products uh, that create an attractive market in India because the needs can potentially be different. There are nuances to how mm. we use and apply uh, technology and, and products, right? So the need to redesign uh, uh, for a new market uh, uh, for a number of different use cases, a new set of customers is something that, you know, we are increasingly doing uh, for our partner companies, uh, our customers. Uh, also, the ability to able to manufacture uh, for with sign, for example, because we have two large manufacturing facilities, one in Hyderabad, the other in Mysore, means that you can manufacture at scale. You know, you have access to a supply chain that's very, very robust, and you can manufacture for this market. The third uh, I would add to that is something that uh, we are uh, looking at and actively pursuing. It's this whole concept of the circular economy. It's about sustainability. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, uh, our customers today is not just about the new products that they're designing for market for tomorrow. It's about the legacy products where uh, the regulatory frameworks, and it started in Europe, uh, are increasingly uh, requiring them to be able to, for example, provide traceability of all the material that's gone to the products, right? It's material traceability, for example. So the whole circular economy, the sustainability, right? Having to redesign, refurbish, recycle. Everything that extracts the maximum life out of uh, the SMEs products, in, whether it's in Europe or in India, is something that uh, I think mm -hmm. are areas for cooperation. So I would say design, manufacturing, sustainability as being three areas where we can help to build a market uh, jointly mm -hmm. with uh, the metal strand companies in Germany. So let me stop there. I know that I'm taking away from my. Then, uh, back to you, uh, that you can do from your Stuttgart uh, headquarters or for Europe. Um, I'll, I'll come to a service uh, sector, Mr. Raghavan. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Raghavan, you are in Germany since one and a half years. You are experiencing, you are also seeing the differences between New York and Germany. Um, you are in Frankfurt, but the middle stand resides most skirts of uh, cities. So what has SBI done for reaching out to the middle stand and which services SBI offers in Frankfurt? Yeah, first of all, <clears throat> thanks to Fiki for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity. Um, a small brief is uh, that as you had uh, told at the beginning, uh, we have been in Frankfurt for almost 50 years now. But uh, I would say that still not very well known and uh, uh, still uh, SBA has been thought of a bank which is here to help uh, Indian corporates uh, to establish uh, businesses in uh, Europe and uh, so forth. But actually we as a global bank, we have been changing our strategy and uh, we are now more looking at uh, also the local corporates and try to become more local. So, in that sense, uh, I would say that uh, there has been a lot of effort in the last few years to reach out to the middle stand. Uh, in terms of, uh, if you see product, this is a typically a wholesale banking branch where uh, we have the, the entire uh, gamut of uh, banking products, right from long term loans to working capital finance to uh, trade. And we have a, a large structure here. I have a big trade finance team, I have a very dedicated uh, corporate uh, loan team mm -hmm. and what we have done uh, uh, we experimented in the last few years is uh, 
that uh, in some other discussion i was just uh, uh, looking at the importance of uh, german language here to reach out to the middle stand uh, customers mm -hmm. so what we have basically done is we have recruited a, 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 a veteran for marketing and putting forth the sbi's initiatives in germany <clears throat> for a local person who has about three decades of experience in banking here in germany and mm -hmm. that has started yielding uh, good results for us that uh, uh, we have been able to get into touch with many of the local middle stand uh, and so the strategy is working and so what we are trying to do now is to expand this team get some more people locally recruited so that we are able to reach out to the local corporates especially those uh, middle stand customers who are looking towards india either they are already having uh, businesses in india or they are looking to start uh, relationships in india because sbi in india is is known uh, mm -hmm. so what we can do in india is also known so what we are trying to do from here is if wherever a middle stand customer uh, or a corporate who wants to establish or have uh, what to say further their business in india uh, we are trying to structure for them a uh, kind of uh, a bridge financing we are also trying to structure the entire gamut of financing uh, including transaction banking and we are also trying to provide uh, credit enhancement tools because many of the middle stand customers may not be able to open out in india and immediately avail banking facilities credit facilities mm -hmm. So we try to have a relationship here and try to extend uh, uh, what's a credit enhancement tool so that it becomes comfortable for them to have banking transactions in India. So uh, that has been our uh, look out. To increase, uh, yeah, increase awareness about SBI, maybe together with FIKI or BBMW yes, or yes. University of India, Make in India, Middle Stand. Because I mean, in India, everybody knows uh, or somehow has banked with uh, SBI. But yes. that is not the case in Germany. Yeah, uh, in fact, my effort has been in the last uh, one and a half years is that that I want to make. See, whenever a customer, local a corporate comes to me, they think about only uh, me as a bank, which is here to help Indian corporates. I am trying to mm -hmm. change that uh, image, and I am saying that the other way around is also something that uh, we would be able to help them with. Great, great to hear, Anuj. Uh, despite all the evil effects of pandemic in India, we have a lot of things going uh, for us, uh, like low tax uh, regime, stable government, economic reforms, production linked incentive scheme, which can put cash into your pocket for up to four to six percent of your sales for next five years if you invest in a production plant. Uh, global companies are trying to de risk themselves, reducing dependence on single source supply chains. Apart from incentives, what is also important for middle strand, but for everybody is the predictability of supply chains, skilled labor and infrastructure. So as a manufacturing company, uh, where do you think India stands on these topics? I think predictability is very important and uh, we are very, uh, you know, long way to go uh, to become a world class. Uh, facilities with in terms of manufacturing or supply chain. Uh, it is very important to deliver in just in time uh, when, when you are delivering to most of the international or multinational OEMs. But also not just delivering in time is important, but also how the OEMs have started thinking in a different way. They want supply chain to become net zero. Net zero emission mm -hmm. is has become important as of now. If I start registering to Volkswagen Group or ZF Babco or most of these international companies and wants to demerge my market share, then they have stringent norms. So I think India has to start looking benchmarking these facilities or these processes. I think we are in just started doing benchmarking as of now. And you will find most of the SME companies don't have much awareness, neither skill development uh, is there in place. So I think we should start creating awareness. In fact, even the owners don't have willingness to do kind of most. I have seen most of the SMEs don't have uh, willingness uh, as well as. So I think we'll have to start somewhere where uh, we start making infrastructure more towards net zero. Whereas Mr. Chabra has also said that in opening session, 
uh, that one of the uh, investments we should plan to become net zero and Germany has taken the target to become net zero by 2030 and to have uh, zero NOx by 2020, 2045. Uh, I think we should start somewhere where there are a lot of training sessions and awareness campaigns, how the mobility uh, should uh, contribute to become net zero as a goal setting. Also, uh, we should learn from Germany uh, how, uh, in fact, most of the technology is already developed in Germany. We should look at the exploring technologies in the field of uh, green hydrogen or e-mobility, also in terms of uh, real estate, uh, commodities, projects, steels, uh, mm -hmm. renewable energy, another area. So I think these are the more or the less where we should look forward and uh, develop more technology. I, and uh, I've seen Germany, most of the uh, states in Northern Germany have come together and created tomorrow. Uh, they have worked for tomorrow and they're ready for tomorrow. And in, for, in fact, for much, much more better living. So we have a lot to go. And uh, well, Anuj, Anuj, you are uh, from uh, automotive components manufacturing. Right. So, yeah. and you are still, I mean, in spite of uh, huge, uh, auto, India is number five automotive uh, manufacturing company. Why do you still think the need of going uh, abroad uh, for uh, additional sales? And I, are you also uh, looking at EV? Yeah, uh, not specifically EV. Uh, because I've seen Germany not very aggressive in EV, they have more aggressive towards hydrogen uh, fuel cell technology. Uh, through EV, people think most of the uh, type of Volkswagen Group or other institutions think that we don't have, we still don't have clean energy. And uh, for me specifically, coming to uh, your point is that it still uh, excites me a lot to look at the technologies, have advanced uh, centric engineering in place innovations should uh, take place and we should start benchmarking and looking uh, the innovations to start from there. Also, um, you learn a lot of manufacturing processes, which is in terms of certified where you have uh, DFME and uh, FME, uh, VDA certificates. So you have a lot of ideas to pull around. Moreover that you should know where your company uh, should be positioned and how should be positioned, whether you want mm -hmm. to position company in leadership way. So to position the leadership way, we have to start looking uh, partnerships. We have to start looking at integrated technology team, uh, R&D team, uh, as we have also partnered with FEV. Uh, FEV is into consulting and uh, technology services. Uh, they are they have test cells, they are worldwide. Uh, uh, they are based in India also. Uh, we They are our technical partners. So that is how you able to create uh, that uh, image in the market and uh, positioning the company becomes very important for me. As you also said, de risking the markets is also important. Also, moreover, uh, most of the inter uh, internationalization is missing in SMA. So I think uh, when we come together, all SMEs can internationalize uh, as one uh, bunch of it to most of the European countries and Germany is one of it. Uh, I think it is also that it uh, brings me out of my comfort zone and go beyond to it so that uh, something keeps challenging and motivates uh, for the new technology. Okay. And that is how we able to bring this technology to our Indian domestic OEMs as well as. So there, where also last thing which I like to say is that uh, what motivates me from uh, this thought process is that keep my company product should add more value to international OEMs. In fact, consumer prefers just looking at the international OEM car design. Also consumer feel that my product, my company product is adding value to that car design. And mm -hmm. that is where the car is getting been sold. <laughs> so that is how the value addition should be there in place. And all of <laughs> this to summarize is that we should be, if we need to be very successful enough and partner, uh, we should be able to partner joint hands with most of the German and Indian companies between German and Indian companies. We need to have that one spirit uh, just to do it. So I think positioning and benchmarking, uh, taking that drive. Also, I was very uh, lo looking at the uh, Mr. Hendrajit's presentation about how the digitization should be put in place. CRM uh, customer relationship has to be put in place. Also, Mr. 
uh, Joseph has put a lot of words in. in yeah, I think, of... I think Anuj, you can uh, get a lot of guidance from Joseph. He has international yeah, M&A and, uh, uh, experience. Uh, I'll quickly go to uh, Rajendra. Um, uh, Rajendra, I have, uh, hello, Rajendra. I have two questions uh, for you. I will ask you simultaneously. Uh, your IPO in the month of February, uh, when India was slipping into second wave, got oversubscribed by 18 times. Uh, does it speak for people's trust in Stowcraft? Uh, or uh, is it uh, the strength of Indian financial market? Or is it rising influence and growing middle class, uh, which is willing to invest more in home appliances? So good evening and uh, thank you, Manojji. I think it's a combination of all this. It's not okay. I don't think uh, one of them only contributes. Of course, uh, the opportunity in, the, in India, it's a, it's a, as uh, already uh, the panelists and the speakers have mentioned, is the first, uh, among the fastest growing uh, economy. The opportunity is also that uh, we have a uh, large population which is uh, getting into the affordable class. More and more uh, people are now having uh, disposable income. And uh, with uh, the uh, economic improvement in the overall uh, population and the financial markets, there's a lot of liquidity also uh, chasing opportunities uh, of investing. I think, and the, the business that we are in, um, I think uh, this is a ever, never uh, ending and never growing uh, business. We are in the business of uh, solving and giving uh, solutions and making life easier in the kitchen. So I think it's a combination of all this, and uh, of course, I yeah. know you have you have uh, you have uh, presence in fourteen different countries, mostly where there is Indian diaspora. So the number of G uh, Indians in Germany is also growing now. So what do you think of uh, Germany as a marketplace, it's or is it only for technology, uh, which uh, you will? Approach I think the bigger opportunity is uh, see uh, uh, Germany is evolved uh, both in technology and financing. I think a uh, combination of these two and those large brands, if they are looking to uh, explore this op this opportunity in India, uh, while India is a very cost conscious uh, country, but uh, the combination of technology and the cost at what India can manufacture, I can say it can be a, a global solution provider if a combination of these two happens. That's, that's great. So uh, you can have collaborations with German companies with their technology and local Manufacturing costs, which you can come yeah. back, okay. right? Localization yes. and I truly design. believe that can be a great combination. Wonderful. Uh, Vinit, I'm coming back uh, to you because of, uh, especially with focus on sustainability, um, uh, which is your passion, and in Germany also is quite advanced on that. Uh, and uh, so, so Germany is much ahead on sustainable energy, wind, solar, and now green hydrogen. We have a number of smart city and metro projects being funded by KFW, the German Development Bank, and BEG. Avada has made a really good experience uh, with both KFW and BEG. So, what, in your opinion, can and should be done on sustainability jointly? First, I'm asking about sustainability. And secondly, uh, you also mentioned uh, that we should focus on abundance and not on scarcity. So, can you elaborate on that and tell us um, that um, uh, how the strategic partnership between India and Germany should function and how it is functioning currently? So, where there is scope for improvement. As we all know that uh, Germany has been the market leader of renewable energy adoption. Mm -hmm. It's because of the German scale a decade back when I entered the renewable energy space. It was only Europe and California who were driving the global market. And mm -hmm. in fact, the most of the expertise worldwide is due to actually German subsidy. I would say that German subsidized the clean energy for the rest of the world. And mm -hmm. the reason China became the manufacturing hub is because of uh, encouraging policy from uh, Germany and German talent and research uh, going there freely. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it actually uh, helped the world uh, to bring down the cost uh, lower than the cost of thermal and conventional power generation. So there is a huge uh, synergy between India and Germany because of mm. its advancement in technology, R&D, innovation. I think German can, uh, uh, can provide uh, the entire manufacturing uh, 
uh, system to India because India has now a very progressive uh, manufacturing policy for the advanced mm -hmm. uh, technology in solar uh, manufacturing and electronics manufacturing. That's where Germany can play a very, very vital role. And second uh, area where Germany should uh, play a very vital role is that uh, they are the leader in ESG stock and ESG exchange. Mm -hmm. And they should uh, make the policy intervention uh, to ensure that there is a positive uh, regulation uh, which uh, helps uh, German private sector and government sector to invest uh, uh, into the infrastructure space and particularly renewable space uh, over uh, many years. And I think uh, they should uh, bring out the policy similar to what uh, uh, China did with the Belt and Road Initiative where the policy and investment and agreements and arrangements were very simple and mm -hmm. uh, there was no confusion among investors and that's what is uh, needed. And uh, and unless that happens, actually, we will keep uh, talking at these conferences in a very yeah, you, you broader are, you way. You are part of the 2019 intergovernmental consultations. I mean, those are the platforms where... So I've been raising this issue at uh, various platforms. Uh, yeah. uh, Germany has been uh, extremely lucky for me. My past venture and this venture, I think I'm the fortunate one, which got two times investment from Germany. But $40 million is peanuts. India needs $40 billion. And in fact, what Germany needs to look at as India as its true strategic partner and select mm -hmm. a favorable treaty with India where they should incentivize each and every uh, policy towards uh, investment and growing India. Because if India becomes uh, stronger uh, and uh, then it kind of uh, creates a new balance uh, in the trade equation in the world. And I think Germany has a very good uh, framework to reduce common emission. They have a carbon ETS market. And uh, being themselves focused on environment and sustainability, they should create some framework and have an ESG, ESG exchange, which, uh, which is not uh, utilized currently fully. And uh, mm -hmm. they should actually uh, bring out an India bond market, an India ETS market. They can, just thinking aloud, they should uh, incentivize project uh, with sustainability plus additionality under uh, UN framework uh, to trade at the, under carbon ETS market. So these are some of the low-hanging fruit. On top of that, mm -hmm. uh, they, their smaller towns and villages are so beautifully built. And uh, they are all smart, they are all green. So Germany, uh, every province should adopt at least uh, one small tassel or a district in India and uh, do a partnership development model. So even if uh, there is a smart city or uh, town adoption by Germany, it will increase uh, uh, the true friendship at people to people level, business to business level and G to G level. And I think they should they are the leader of EU taxonomy. If they mm -hmm. can drive the taxonomy uh, towards swelling pool of ESG related capital flow, that would be amazing because that's what is the need of our. Correct. I mean, you have some good ideas and I hope you continue to be part of this inter uh, uh, India, EU, India, Germany uh, dialogue. Uh, Pallavi, I know you are sending me a message. Um, so we have next uh, event waiting. So gentlemen, we had an extremely interesting discussion with knowledgeable and experienced panel. The time provided by Pallavi to us was too short, uh, but the dialogue will continue and dialogue must continue. Germany and India are at very different level of economic strength and industrialization, but both are looking towards sustainable and inclusive growth based on common values and democratic principles. While the world is moving towards autocratic rule, opaque practices, and unipolar vision of dominance, it becomes all the more important for India and Germany to cooperate at different levels. As Vinit mentioned, individual level, industry level, academia, think tanks, organizations, and policy making. India can rely on Germany's sustainability, skills development, industrial clusters, 
industry 4.0 initiatives, innovation and research and development organizations. And Germany can rely on India's democratic values, uh, predictable policies, multilateral approach, and a market with 1.3 billion population and IT and engineering skills, as well as affordable medicines, vaccines, and healthcare personnel uh, for the future. Uh, challenges are definitely there in India, uh, but the challenges, uh, as um, Dr. Mohad, uh, the Consul General from Mumbai, uh, he said the challenges are outweighed by the enormous opportunities. And uh, Dr. Mohad should know it better uh, with his six years experience in Mumbai than anybody else. So I thank you uh, once again. Uh, thank you, Vinit. Thank you, Anuj, Rajendra, Raghavan, and Joseph also for joining at the last moment uh, for your participation in the discussion. And I thank the organizers. And most of all, I thank the participants uh, for their attention and patience. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Back to you, Pallav. Thank you, Manoj, and and uh, I'm really sorry. I know we started a little late, uh, but then you know these dialogues can just go on and on. So yeah. it means we should do. It means we should organize such interactions more often. And um, when you talked about the participants, more longer longer period of time. <laughs> Yes, that's true because uh, we are, you know, all, almost uh, touching three hours since we begin, and the number of participants, uh, you know, uh, still remain same. So that's that's very encouraging for us. Uh, well, now moving on to the last part uh, of the of, of today's summit, um, uh, this which is a valedictory session. Uh, for the valedictory session, uh, we have uh, we will be joined by Mr. Norbert Bartley, Parliamentary State Secretary to the Federal Minister for Economic Co Cooperation and Development. Uh, due to some urgent region, re reasons, he can't join in person, but he has sent us a, a very uh, lovely video message, which I'm going to play for you now. Uh, and just bear with me for for a few seconds. I am going to open that video for you. Can you see my screen? Yes. That's great. Mr. Yoga, State Secretary Kafka, Secretary General Ginoy, my fellow parliamentarian, Mr. Wiese, ladies and gentlemen, small and medium sized enterprises are crucially important. Uh, I'll have to request all the panelists to please uh, 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 switch mute on. Otherwise, we will listen this uh, echo at the background. Thank you.
So uh, that was uh, Mr. Bartley. Thank you, Mr. Bartley, for your time and, and kindly sharing this video with us. Uh, well, he did uh, point it out on, on some of the key aspects where in India and Germany work together, especially with the help of German Mittelstand and, and build on each other's strength. So without further delay, I would now like to invite Mr. Jan, Mr. Andreas Jan, the head of international marketing BMW. Mr. Yan is a former representative of the Foundation of, uh, for Basic Values and International Understanding in Berlin. He has served as a advisor in the office of Johannes Zeller from the CDU CSU Polytechnic since 2009. During this time, he was also a representative in the German Bundestag Committee for Economic Cooperation and Development. Since 2019, he is heading the politics and foreign trade for BBMW. Mr. Jan, your closing remarks, please. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Palladi Mishra. Excellencies, distinguished executive director, Mr. Markus Jergam, distinguished secretary general, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. But first of all, I would like to tell you that I'm really grateful for this wonderful discussion of so important issues with such an outstanding forum today. Before I will conclude, I would like to say thank you so much to those who drew up courage to prepare this outstanding event. First of all, I would like to thank Daniel Wacham and Manu Bafe who organized this wonderful discussion together with all the stakeholders of FIKI. I also would send my sincere gratefulness to Reinhard Ungern von Sternbeck, Tetiana Pilecka and uh, Ali Garayev for all their work to make this great event happen. Perfectly well done all. I would like to address special thanks to Pilani Mishra, who was an excellent moderator and brilliant master of ceremony of our today's discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Pilar. Knowledge sharing is an important part of what we do together with FIKI and BBMW. I have to admit that reflected on the last three hours, I have rarely seen such an array of speakers of different disciplines, sectors, and markets speaking with powerful conviction about the need for integrated cooperation between the SMEs in Germany and India. We have heard how to strengthen the knowledge across the SME business between Germany and India. We have also learned so much from individual examples and insights. Events like today, like our event, can help to reflect real practice and market needs in our common strategy and work programs. We have shown over the last three hours that we are ready, determined, and willing to meet the challenge. To, in the words of Norbert Bartlett, the State Secretary of the German Federal Government, to scale up action as we face the multiple and interconnected megatrends that we will force the great reset after the corona crisis referred to Dilip Chenny, the Secretary General of FIGI. As the largest voluntary association for small and medium businesses, we currently represent all across Europe 33 member association with nearly 2.1 million companies and more than 20 million employees. Those entrepreneurs stand in our society for the value of individual freedom, and for that reason, they are the resilient backbone of the economy in Europe. This is a great result of our today's discussion. We have learned 
that SME cooperation between India and Germany will help to build a more collaborative and efficient global architecture for sustainable development. Effective cooperation can only be achieved by overcoming bureaucratic hurdles that still exist on the political level in Europe. Markus Jäger and Dilip Czerny did take into serious account the need to have modern and competitive SMEs in order to bring the world economy back on track after this serious crisis. Please remember one lesson from the last crisis in 2008. 80% of new jobs created in Europe after 2008 were created within small and medium-sized companies. They are the last ones fired and the first to hire. So Ficky and BBMW will play a major role in building a new collective mindset uh, between India and Germany, alongside its partners such as multilateral development banks and the World Federation of Development Finance Institution and its regional associations. More than ever, Ficky and BBMW BBMW have a crucial role to play for the SMEs, both counter-cyclical to cope with the crisis and in support of investments for the definition of new development model. The discussion today did provide an outstanding opportunity to form a new coalition of actors between Germany and India in order to launch a collective dynamic aimed and fostering coordinated responses to global issues. FICI and BVMW will strongly support those responses. So thank you so much, all of the participants, all of the SMEs, uh, all of the, um, the speakers and stakeholders uh, for this opportunity to meet and exchange experiences with you. I'm so grateful for all the comments in the plenary sessions and in the panel discussions in support of this praiseworthy network. The endorsements from SME Business have been extremely encouraging. So to conclude, let me just say that we all seek to innovate the SME sector between Germany and India. We all seek to listen what the customer needs to better serve the market and to better serve our communities here in Germany and in India. And we all seek to adapt retail, the post-corona world to the digital age. We need strong SMEs in a strong world. Thank you so much. God bless you. Stay healthy and all the best to everybody. Thank you, Mr. Yang, for uh, perfectly summing up the whole session. Last three three hours and fifteen minutes uh, in in such smart words. Uh, on behalf of Vicky and and uh, BBMW, I thank all the participants for joining us today. We will get in touch with those who have shared uh, shared their interest in post event networking. You will hear from us soon, and we hope to see you in the second Indo German Middle Stance Summit, probably next year. You'll hear from us about that. Stay safe, stay happy, and then off with us.